Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Baka 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 Podcast. Little Baka! 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 It's amazing how every time you open your mouth, you prove you're an idiot. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Baka Baka Baka. We are an anime podcast where every two weeks we come together to discuss an anime we recently watched on this podcast. We do it like we're a book club, and we turn the discussion over to you, our comment section. Tell us why we're right, why we're wrong. Fill in all the details, because we are just three bakas. That's the concept. If this is your first time here. It's a good episode. This is a good one to pick. Welcome. To do the thing we do, I need the help of my co-host. And first off, he's the syrup to my pancakes, because he's very sweet. It's Jeremy, Aww. with his hot take to let you know... Something about him. Hot take, Jeremy. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, the only character that's crazier than the character that has their eyes closed all the time is the character that has their eyes open all the time. And they have Mr. Popo eyes. That is crazier. I ain't touch it, Mr. Popo with it. <laughs> it's amazing how every time you open your mouth, you prove you're an idiot. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't know what that means, but that's fine. I don't. I don't need to expound. I think Jimmy okay. understands. <laughs> All right. Uh, and my name is Troy. I'm the main dish. Oh no, that's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> At best, I am an amuse bouche. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Um, my hot take: not every anime needs a perfect cell. That's true. That didn't make sense, but... But we get him so often, I guess. <laughs> um, oh, you know, let's go another way. Every single anime needs a Yamcha. Do they, though? This is really just like, I don't like this character, or I like this character. <laughs> I don't like Yamcha. No. No one likes Yamcha. <laughs> That's why you need him. Yamcha's awesome. You need someone to blow up. Right. Yeah. The guy became a baseball player. <laughs> Followed his dreams. Um, I, I saw you go, right. Yeah. <laughs> Hot takes threw me a little bit. I didn't. <laughs> We're okay. Hey, guess what anime we watched? Delicious, Delicious in dungeon. dungeon. Wow, you guys are good guessers. <laughs> yeah, we watched mm-hmm. the the first twelve episodes of Delicious in Dungeon, and that is what we we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to start off with some non spoiler reviews. I picked it, so someone else go first. Yay! Um, it's a fun anime. Uh, it's like if Food Kitchen had more stabbing. Um, not Food Kitchen. Uh, Food Wars. Food Wars. <laughs> Um, I like the name Food Kitchen, though. We need yeah, an anime kitchen. like that. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. Um, the show is does world building brilliantly. Um, I had a lot of fun learning about how the world works, and they do a good job of not like expedi- uh, exposition dumping huge amounts of data. They they sprinkle it out, and it's um, it's pretty refreshing. It's also a decent comedy as well. Um, I didn't find myself laughing out loud at all, but I did find a lot of stuff humorous. Um, And the cooking is interesting. However, I do feel it gets a little old after a while, especially that the reactions always seem to be the same. Um, So, you know, and then that leads to funny moments when it's not. So... But I think I think there's some criticism that we'll get into more. But besides that, uh, yeah, I think it's worth picking up. Would you say it has a Krillin character? Ch- Chillichek. It does not. No. He's, he's Chillichek is Krillin. He's small. If okay, but <laughs> that's his criteria. <laughs> he he never fights. That's not <laughs> his thing. He, he throws knows. a knife. You know what anime doesn't need? Small people. <laughs> What's wrong people with you? People got no reason to live. <laughs> thanks, thanks There's a song me. about that. Yeah, I know. I know. 
Um, Jeremy, why don't you share your your non spoiler <laughs> review? Save us. Um, I I really loved this anime. I was surprised too because in the first episode or two, I didn't think I was gonna like it that much. I was kind of resisting it, just for that reason where I thought, is this another silly cooking anime? I mean, Food Wars was it was fun, but I don't know. It just didn't seem like it was going to be that great when I started watching it. But it really won me over. And I, I love the technicality of the cooking. The recipes are fascinating because they are nothing but fluff. They make you feel immersed like you're in that world or you're building a world like that. And everything fits together, right? Like the way that they have to deal with different ingredients to prepare them makes you start thinking about well what happens if you don't what what other things could you do to prepare it differently and get maybe a alchemical reaction out of it or something right because cooking is of course chemistry so it's it's just right there on the edge of alchemy and i i love that it it was so cool to see how much thought was put into this by the writers and and i think that's probably what i would say is the defining reason why i love this so much is clever thoughtful writing it is it is so well done uh in the way that it tells the story and how it weaves little bits of information about the world into everything so yeah oh and the art style there is something about this art style that is different and i mean studio trigger is always they always have great art but there is a a flavor almost a silhouette to the faces and the way the eyes are drawn part of it to me harkens back to like 90s anime a little bit like I, I see the influence but i also and i had to <laughs> i had to go back and and watch the trailer for it just to see like am i crazy is this just nostalgia which is crazy because it's i hated the show i was terrified of it so it can't be nostalgia i don't know what the word would be for that but the hobbit the uh, rotoscoped hobbit oh yeah cartoon and every time I saw Chillichuk's face and some of the other like halfling characters and some of the dwarves, the way that they would draw them, there's a general silhouette of the features and the layout of the face that just it was so reminiscent of that to me. And um, there's something really cool about it. Yeah. So I, I love it. It's a great anime. You're absolutely right about the art style. It's a little unique for an anime and it, mm -hmm. it was really refreshing, actually. Yeah. For me, I definitely liked it. Um, I think one of its biggest detriments is that we watched it really shortly after Free Run. <laughs> like, Free Run to me just hit so well. And I said that during the Free Run interview. Like, everything after this is going gonna, gonna to hurt for a little bit. Uh, but this this was a really good anime. I don't actually have it much to complain about. Um, I really enjoyed how it... It's taking a world that's living and breathing and moving, and we're coming in and seeing a snapshot of it in these these episodes. And if so many anime, it feels like the anime was, or the world is waiting for us to start watching for the, it to start, right? It's just like, hey, I'm going to go on this adventure right now, episode one. Uh, these characters are already mid-adventure when we walk in, and like they already know each other and relationships are ending and starting and all this stuff. And, and this, this world has been going on for a while. This, this whole system. Um, I kept thinking about your guys's baby doll anime. Can you pick up girls? Is it wrong to pick up girls in a dungeon? Oh, and, yeah. and how this just takes a very similar concept of the dungeon world and makes it work and feel like, yeah, but oh, there's no harem. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. Could be better. <laughs> sure. No. Uh, the, so, better than that, not quite hitting the peak of Free Run, but very close. Free Run's a high bar, though. I know. I know. I'm, I don't know. For I, some of us, it soared over that very <laughs> middling anime. <laughs> All right. So... Uh, intros and outros. What would you guys think of this, the music, the OP, the ED? Both of them, like, the first thing that came to mind was they were fun. Um, I felt like they weren't taking themselves too seriously uh, while kind of introducing the characters, and then especially the ED. The ED was just like, look at all these fun things we're doing. Um, the music was okay. 
uh, I enjoyed them. Yeah, there was uh, in the first few episodes again. I didn't like the music that much. It just didn't land with me. Either one, um, and the the visuals were mildly intriguing. But as the story went on, and I skipped it most of the time, but as the story went on, and then I came back to it later on. I found myself drawn into it. I really liked the OP. And uh, now I can't stop humming it. I love the song. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if it's it's more that the OP was improved over time with the anime or it needed time to maybe marinate <laughs> in my head. But just the visuals of having all of these characters one at a time being giant in front of, you know, a completely different party that is doing something in this world, it created a sense of... of almost awe and a bigger world by doing that and it also i don't know if it said something about like the uh the main guy laos laos um i just kept thinking he looks like he's in a jail in that first shot and so i was wondering what each shot was trying to say about the characters yeah um because he's being like confined to not eat monsters by the societal norms. <laughs> so like, is that his jail? <laughs> he's breaking out in the anime. So then I was like trying to apply it to the other characters in the OP. And I'm like, I got nothing. <laughs> I don't have a clue. Uh, the outro is fine. It, pretty good song. Interesting how it's just like trying to show you what they're like when they're not adventuring. The OP is done by Bump of Chicken, who did my favorite Spy Family OP. Um, but even with that said, they, they sound very, it sounds very different. They did a great job of like making this whimsical wonder uh, with uh, the way they play the instruments. I think there's a loop in there. I'm not sure, but it, just, it feels very fantasy world. The very first part of the OP screams Suikoden to me because of the instrument that's used for the first like yeah, yeah. five to ten seconds. It just screams it. Yeah, so I, I feel like it fits really well. It just it it fit the world so perfectly. The ED, first off, Netflix is like next episode. Let's go. We're in a, you don't you don't need to see this for more than five seconds. I'm like you know I I need to talk about this and I need to listen to it. Um, it never really, it honestly didn't ever grab me. And I know, um, there's small, very tiny spoiler. There's an episode that ends literally on a shot of a bloody skull. And then this like fun, bouncy ED starts playing. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, that, no. oh, that is a, that is rough. <laughs> um, you did like the, the, the credit scroll that you get yeah, from Rezero. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just, it, it, and it was like a very gory, well depicted skeleton too. It, it has, it's a very mm -hmm. somber moment. And just goes into this, and we're going a longer day. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So, um, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't like I, I wasn't trying to turn it off or anything. I wasn't like, yeah, skip it, Netflix. Let's go. Um, <laughs> so it, it is what it was. Okay. Before we go on to our spoiler section where we're going to talk about everything about this show, these 12 episodes that we know about, um, just so you know, in our next episode, we're going to watch the rest of this. Episodes 13 through 20, 24. And this is a good time to note. So the mangaka who wrote Delicious in Dungeon refused to sell the rights to turn it into an anime until the manga was fully completed. Because they oh. felt that so many times a studio will buy a first season, make it great, and then sell it off to a lower production cheaper studio like hey we we got our one punch man season one we're done <laughs> uh dungeon meshy delicious and dungeon spoiler spoiler warning alert. we're gonna be spoiling stuff uh like i said we only know what's in these 12 episodes but we are going to be guessing and theorizing and spoiling mostly yeah spoilers. but don't spoil us for 20 13 through 24 give us two weeks and then yeah Chances are you're not going to have a chance to spoil it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Ooh, you <laughs> got to bring that up, did you? <laughs> that, that one was not me, Troy. Uh, not. <laughs> Look, if we release them in, a, in the episodes in a certain order, they're not going to know there's there that many production issues behind the scenes. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. 
can, I can <laughs> cover it up if we don't just talk. About, we just push. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> First All episode. Right. First episode. <laughs> so we start with a a narrator telling us about how in this tiny village, in this cellar, a man just emerges from a chasm. And he's like, hey, I is the leader of the Golden Lands that were here a thousand years ago, hundred years ago, long time ago. And then the Mad Mage uh, sank it all. And if you can defeat the Mad Mage, I'll give you my kingdom. That is the narration we're told to set this up. Uh, we then, of course, jump forward in time. I mean, we need to set, set up the dungeon before we get to the actual story, though. So so why don't you guys help me? What, what's your understanding of what a dungeon is? It They made it sound like there are different categories of dungeons and normally a dungeon is some sort of structure that is infused with mana to make it do what it's supposed to do and because of that infusion of mana it attracts monsters or monsters are born from it this particular dungeon however seems to be unique from other dungeons and the fact that the mad it, it, so from what i've gathered a mad mage scrawled some runes around a large area and castle like ca and when i say castle i'm not talking just the keep building i'm talking about ca like the, town, the entire the castle land town. yeah and he sank it into the ground and fused the whole thing with mana and now he just lives down there um so it, it's uh, and it's made in abyss style uh where mm -hmm. As yeah. you go down, the monsters get harder. The first couple levels, there's actually like shops and people that live down there. And, you know, the, like on the third level, there's like criminals that have established like taverns and stuff. So it's it's a really interesting concept. And also because of the mana infusion, it seems that there's different rules for different dungeons. In this specific dungeon, your soul never leaves your, or at least is chained to your body, whether you die or not. And so that what that means is that, say you take a fatal wound and you quote unquote die, your spirit doesn't go anywhere. And so even normal healing magic can resurrect you because as soon as you repair, let's say your heart gets cut in half. If you repair the heart, the soul didn't go anywhere. So you just stand up. You're just alive now, um, which really brings an interesting dynamic to how the all the characters in this story treat fatal wounds like they, they obviously don't want to get injured but it's also like oh yeah this is like my sixth time dying yeah, like, everyone <laughs> has died before like it's, it's a really horrible inconvenience right and so like resurrection magic doesn't seem to be a requirement here it, you just need a mage who can heal um in order for I you know, didn't you to come back. I it, got the impression that it was technically resurrection magic. I remember the line where they said, if you heal the body, the soul, the spirit comes back into it. But I thought they said more easily because otherwise, um, what's your name? Marcel should have been able to do the resurrection just using regular healing magic, but she switched to dark magic because she didn't know. So it, it, it depends. So the way she described it is d depending on the state of the corpse. So, for instance, right. when we see one of the characters get shot through the head, all they had to do was heal the wound and she woke up. But, for instance, they came across someone who had been being digested by a plant. He yeah. was too far. The body was too far gone for her level of magic to get him to a state where he could then be resurrected. So you would have to take him to the resurrection office, which lives on the first floor of this dungeon. So it's a really cool place. And the only reason we know all this is because they do a really good job of doing the world building throughout the entire story. Like you don't learn this on episode one, but I think it is important to set up this very first scene hmm. of losing one of the party members. So Troy, I'll, yeah. I'll let you go. Well, well, plus just to add to that, there's also, you learn about, corpse retrievers like i've never heard that before in an anime in a story being told where they're like oh yeah adventurers come down here in the dungeons and they go about their business 
and there's just this corpse retriever job. Sometimes you come in and you get the, the dead bodies and you bring them out to resurrect them. So one thing that I think, and I don't have proof for this, but it seems to be this, is the corpse retrievers don't grab you, pull you up to the first level, and then res you. They store you on a shelf. And I yeah. think the reason yeah. they do that is because they're waiting for someone to come pay them yes. To, yes. To, to res them, which is hilarious. It's basically yep. towing for yeah. bodies. You <laughs> it's impound. You get impounded yeah. if they find you. <laughs> yep. Uh, I love that you mentioned Made in Abyss because that thought actually popped in my head while yeah. I was watching this. The whole idea of like something mysterious and dangerous has appeared and people built an economy about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> yep. Okay. So yeah, the, the first scene. We see a party of adventurers fighting a giant red dragon. I went back and rewatched this to try to figure out where they were in the dungeon. They're in a cave. It could technically be. They've got to be on six earlier. or seven. But yeah, because they I mentioned the dragon comes seven. up, right? Because he ran the orcs out after this event. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. But yeah, so I just think that's cool because it's not like we have to go deeper than we've ever gone it's like no we just have to we just have to go on it's a time limit anyway it, this elden ring style like oh i died now i gotta get back to where i was to keep going <laughs> <laughs> yes uh our main character leos yeah. does anyone know how to say his name <laughs> pretty sure yeah. it's leos leos yeah um he he just sits there the whole fight like Man, I'm hungry. We're all kind of sluggish. We lost our food. Uh, this is this is rough. We've we, done this before. This yeah, is gonna, yeah. It, he's bad. like he's hardly paying attention to the fight. He even says like we can handle this, and then he just starts thinking about food, and and, and then the next thing he knows, he's being pushed <laughs> as the dragon's mouth is coming at him, and it's his his sister who's one of the mages in the group, and she gets eaten, and he's like what? And then she's like half hanging out the dragon's mouth, and she casts a return spell. So everyone Before the return spell, he notices, oh, half my party's dead. <laughs> yep. I don't think anyone was dead. I think they're just down. There are a bunch of bodies Incapac on the ground. Incapacitated. Okay. Because he just they got the up two. and walked away. Yeah, they, quit. they, they literally so. quit. Yeah. So, yeah, he um, he wakes up and he's in a field of flowers. Uh, this is, again, Leos, uh, your guys' thoughts on our main character. He's funny. Um, he's just kind of this quirky, tries to take the job seriously, but continually screws up. Um, he he likes to, he has a fascination with how monsters in the dungeon might taste. And not like, I want to lick them. I want to consume them as my meal. Like, he's, and, and I, I, it's it's an I'm not sure the joke holds up the entire anime, but it it is lighthearted comedy when it comes to it. So yeah, at first I kind of thought he was a little bit shallow because of that obsession, and because so much of the time he's just kind of imagining things. I guess he's he's oblivious. He's not really paying attention. Um, and so I thought, wow, this is kind of a one note character, but he turned out to be more complex than that. And like you said, the, the joke, it does go for quite a while and it's, it's okay. It's pretty good. Um, but I do think of the characters for me, he was the weakest. Um, he was still fine, probably about average for most anime, but, but yeah, the other characters really outshone him for me. I'll address the joke thing first. I think the reason it was fine for me is because it's attached to the fact that he has this encyclopedic knowledge of monsters. Like, he has been studying and learning about monsters since for so long now. And from it has come this nat new desire to taste them. It's the one thing he doesn't know about them is what do they taste like? Uh, you know, I know all their weak spots, how they react. I know um, all these things about monsters. Now I want to try eating them. Um yeah, I do think it runs a little long, and it's a a big thing that threw me in this anime is is like, oh, my sister got eaten. 
Well, that's a bummer. I wonder what scorpion tastes like. <laughs> like yeah. Um, exactly. it, ticking clock, <laughs> right? Why is he not like banging on Lake? We gotta go. We gotta go. It, it is a little off putting at first, but what I really liked about this character is that he's not. I'm gonna be the pirate king, or I'm gonna go brood, and all these characters are gonna drag me along, and then I'll just use my ultimate power and, and save the day. He's just a guy. He is just, he's not the hero of a story. He's just another adventurer doing adventurer work. He's not really special in any way at all, which is insane in an anime. That, that almost never happens. That they're just like, yeah, here is random soldier adventurer, and he just happens to get into this adventure where he you know, is going to eat monsters in the dungeon. That's the only thing special about him. Uh, and I, I just find that really refreshing. Uh, the whole That goes for the whole party. Like, um, I think Marcel, they mentioned, is a genius, but we don't know if it's true or not because it's from her point of view. But, yeah. you know, most of these characters are just blue-collar working guys in this economy that, you know, sucks. <laughs> and, and it was really cool. I liked it. Uh, yeah, so that he works for me. And I don't think in a long, like a five season anime, he, he would. That's why I'm kind of happy this, this ends. Like, I'm excited to see where it goes. And then he's good enough to carry it for that long. Mm -hmm. All right. He uh, finds out what just happened. And uh, the other mage in their party, Marcel the elf, runs up to him and is like, oh my gosh, what happened to Fallon? That's the sister. Um, and he and he's like, oh no, she was in the mouth of the dragon, and she's like, all our stuff, you know, all our backpacks and stuff are still back there. We didn't get anything, so now we're broke. Uh, but yeah, Marcel is their mage, another great character. Your guys' thoughts on her? Uh, I the first couple of episodes, I was a little worried they were just gonna be a crutch to be the comedic relief because. She's constantly tripping. She's constantly unable to use her magic in a serious way. She's always got terrible ideas. Um, but as the anime goes on, she's fantastic. Um, I, I like the comedic aspect of her just going, what are you cooking? And also, I like that she's she helps the group think outside the box, especially when it comes to the magic that she uses. And they, the party uses her magic as a resource and not just a I win button because it, we come to find out real quickly. It's not, it's just another tool in the toolbox, which I did appreciate as well. Um, yeah, she's funny. She's caring. Um, she <laughs> tends to keep the party on track. Like, Hey, you have a sister that's digesting. Come on, let's go. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, she was, she was great. Yeah, I really like this character. Um, I like the spunk, and I like how much she was trying to fight them about eating the food. Um, but I think what won me over com in the end for her was when she got injured. And the way that they handled the injury, I, I, you never see anime do this. Anime do not take injuries seriously. This anime took it so seriously. What she basically had was two pass-through bullet holes one in the thigh and one in the shoulder. But that was enough to completely incapacitate her and leave her in a state where she could just barely even stay conscious, let alone speak or make any sound. You want and, some liver, Marcel? I know. It was, it was great. It just like that entire scene. And there's, a, there's another scene that just had me dying. I loved it. It was so... They gave her the uh, the cute cartoony faces that they always do for like silly stuff. And so there's one where she hears something makes her go insane and so she gets dumb face for a little <laughs> while and it's just great i love it um but i also like the complexity like there's more of a depth to her as you said troy we don't really know whether she's being 100 percent honest about who she is what she knows how old she is we don't know how old she is um and so the only thing that we really know is what she says and it seems like her actions are somewhat in harmony with it. Like she does desire to find some way to make the the dungeon or make a dungeon that is full of just beneficial things. I kind of think that that is part of her journey and her storytelling. I mean, this is a um, Eastern story. 
So in the end, it's probably going to conclude with her realizing that you have to have the bad with the good. Um, mm. So I think that's part of her arc, but that's where she is right now. And she's kind of looking at using um, unorthodox methods to attain positive goals and using negative things for positive results. And that's that's cool. It makes her an interesting character. So I'm I interested love, to see where they go with it. I loved her line of, you know, magic is not moral, uh, yes or no, or good or bad. It's how you use it. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a really good line. Yeah. Tell that to a necromancer. <laughs> <laughs> Necromancer's like, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, super agree with that. Um, I did have the worry that she was going to be like this ditz, like you said, the, the joke of the group. Um, while it was very funny, you know, the stuff she was going through in those first couple episodes, um, she's she's kind of being a, in the Mr. Magoo situation. <laughs> she's she's always the, the problem. But, yeah, she ends up being very essential, very competent. Um, and we find out that, yeah, that she is actually a very competent mage, especially because she's like, oh, I'm not as good as, as the other mage. I just but she specifically is talking about healing magic, which is not her specialty. And ended up her her fight with the Undyne is one of my favorite scenes, and she yeah. gives her this moment to shine. At, in a, you know, yes, yeah, she gets hurt, but she goes, she fights to you know as hard as she can, and like I said, shows her competency, and it only grows from there. So she she definitely won me over. Um, you know, I watched the English dub. Her voice her voice was very unique. It it's like the smartest Valley Girl you ever heard. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, a little bit, huh? Right? It's not she's not dumb, but there's a little bit of Valley Girl in there. That's awesome. Um uh it, it worked for me. There's another voice I wanna mention but later. Um yeah, there the third party member walks up and the other two have turned in resignation letters because they've been scouted by other party members and hey, now that they're broke, they gotta go take those jobs. So sorry about your sister, but you know, life in the dungeon happens. And this, but the character who stays, he is a, what do they call him in this? It's a halfling, but. Half foot. Half foot. Um, have you guys heard that one before? In, in other, halflings called that before? Oh. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Chilchuck. He is their trap and lock picking expert of the party. Your guys' thoughts on Chilchuck? Interesting take. I thought he was going to be more of the roguish character that could do lockpicking and traps, but no. He, he lockpicking and traps, it's like his job. That's what he <laughs> yeah. does. Anything else is extra. Uh, but yep. um, he was definitely the straight man of the group, uh, so the comedy bounced off him pretty well. I also liked uh, the way they developed his trauma. Uh <laughs> And, like, the things that, like, really freaked him out and the reasons why they freaked him out um, were were really well done. And then also his level-headedness. So, for instance, where, Mar- uh, you know, she gets two through wounds through the shoulder and the leg, he's he's going, look, we really need to consider sending her back because even if we are able to heal her, she's going to have no mana. And, like, those kinds of situations and, like, coming to different... Um, conclusions and solutions he was a really cool character yeah he was he was great um again one of the things i really liked was just the way that the art style differentiated the races Mm. made it so clear like you could tell even just from the silhouette of these guys at a distance like oh that's a gnome that's a that's a half foot and uh, yeah as a dwarf very very different and it, it wasn't the traditional like what you would expect from anime where you've got like I mean, there there are the big dog people, the kobolds, but you don't have a lot of like, hey, there's there's your your furry cat person, there's your lizard person, there's your variations on elves. It, this was very Western uh, fantasy, and it, it it almost lost me a dog. Like I saw the dog person, and mm-hmm. I was like, wait a minute, okay, yeah. well, hold on. What I thought yeah. all the weird stuff was in the dungeon, but and now all of a sudden yep. there's a dog man walking around, and then they're like, it's a kobold, and I'm like. Well, I guess technically that works. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. That checks. That that tracks. Pass. Especially uh-huh. since that joke worked so well twice. Yeah. He's like sniffing the ground. I know who it is. <laughs> um, 
yeah, uh, he was fine. He was a good character. I, I don't have anything to add, though. I liked all the things that you were saying. Uh, he, he's my favorite character. I think he exemplifies the, the best of, like, just a regular guy doing his job, even more than uh, Laos was. He he even goes on, like, this is my job. I'm not here for the adventure. I'm not here for the family. <laughs> the same Fast and Furious. This is my nine to five. And they're even asking personal questions. He's like, I, I don't want to tell you. We're not, I don't want to get that close. Um, you know, they they come across one of the party members who quit later and they're being scolded. And he's like, people need to get paid. Like, we have to earn livings. That's why we take all this danger on. And he even points out when they try to guilt this character in, like, you can't do that. That'll ruin their reputation, which will ruin their job status and then the type of jobs they'll get. You you just can't do that. He's the realist of the group. Like you said, he's the great straight man. You should even so, watch out for people that say they'll do it for no money. He's like, those are the ones you need to be careful of. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll be honest, usually in a, a team of adventurers, the uh, trap finder and the lockpick guy person is almost the most boring. The the detail they put into why he's important and why you need to have him on the team and what he's able to do, um, showing the the behind this the like those the blueprints of the traps and stuff, totally made it work for me. One of the best of those type of character class that I like. Like I guess it would normally be a rogue, right? Uh, with, just mm-hmm. without the theft, but yeah, worked for me really well. Um, I. One other thing I want to point out, because I 100% agree with you, what you said is that like there's a point where they're like, we saved days because of having yeah. you on the team, because you were mm-hmm. able to get us through passages that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, so again, just more world building. Like the, these jobs are important for these reasons. And his it, his near the end, I, guys, you know I'm not fighting, right? I am not fighting. <laughs> I can't <laughs> fight. I'm not a fighter. I, I don't even have a weapon. And he doesn't. Well, it, but it is funny how he says all of this, but then earlier he says, yeah, that's why I always ask for pay up front. And then they call him on it and they're like, yeah, but you're sticking around. Like you yeah, didn't have to go true. back into the dungeon to finish this job. <laughs> that's true. All right. So, uh, Leos, his, his whole thing is, okay, we gotta get, I gotta get back to my sister um, we're out of funds. He, his first question is like, can we sell the current armor we have and use that to buy, buy cheap armor and supplies and more uh, adventurers? Um, which kind of hints that they're already kind of, high, you know, if you're thinking this in RPG terms, they're high level. They're wearing at least mm-hmm. moderately good gear if, if he's even considering selling it for other stuff. Now, Chilchuck does say no, but we won't be able to afford any of those things. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like I said, it's just kind of a hint that these aren't, this is not their first rodeo. They're not, these aren't rookies. Uh, so he decides, hey, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in alone. And they tell him, no, we will go with you. And he's like, well, because I'm i I'm not going to buy supplies. I'm going to just eat the monsters in the dungeon. And they're like, that's insane. And he's like, no, I have a book. It tells you what you can and can't eat. The whole thing is an ecology system. They're, it's edible. <laughs> we can do it. And they reluctantly agree, and they go into the first level. Now, the first level of the dungeon is technically still the cellar that it originally sprang from, um, but obviously has expanded, and they find a scorpion in there. And, like, in the middle of the square where all these adventure parties are, like, preparing and stuff, they start trying to cook, boil this, this scorpion they caught and eat it. And this dwarf comes along who's like, you're doing it all wrong. Let me show you how to prep this. Let me uh, let me take some of these grave plants <laughs> yeah. that throw it on the corpses around us and throw that in there for some flavoring. Uh, this <laughs> is Senshi, uh, the dwarf who carries a giant uh, wok on his back. <laughs> like like Mongolian style. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, guys, it's just the fact that it's, it's adamantium is amazing. I I love everything about this guy. <laughs> your guys' thoughts on Senchi? Uh, he's he's great. Um, he's been living in the dungeon for quite some time, so not only does he know like what to cook and how to cook, but he also has decent relationships with all sorts of people down here, um, and monsters. 
And so it's he's he's really fun because he's so single minded that he could like they could be being attacked. But if he's in the middle of cooking, it's like, OK, you know, this is what I'm doing. Or, hey, I need that ingredient. Give it to me. I know you've got a knife to my throat, but I need that. Ingredient. Yep. Yep. I want to make um, bread. Right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, he was a great addition to the party. Yeah, I love this guy. He is so funny. And it, earlier I was saying that he is both out of his element and in his element a lot. <laughs> and it's really funny to see the contrast because he's he's really not there to fight. He does a little bit of fighting, but most of his fighting is hunting. Yeah. Really, he's like little... when he's away from the party. Yeah. And and so but he is very capable because he's got some crazy uh farming techniques that we'll get into later that require some massive skill and knowledge and uh, just the fact that at one point in time he had an adamantium shield and had it melted down and turned it into a walk. You know, like I don't know. It's just he is such a cool character. I, I wonder to what what have his eyes seen that caused them to stay open wide like that at all uh, times? That's where the hot take came from. Yes, because Senshi has seen some stuff like he's been <laughs> down in these dungeons for years living down here. Um, we, we find out that he's basically a dungeon caretaker. And and so. I genuinely wonder, like, how has that affected him mentally? The, the the whole arc that we have, like, not really arc, but like the little story beat we have about his his hair and his beard and how it like protects him from magic because it has blood and guts and, and sweat and grease, and so it like reduces the effect. It's, it's like it's like a, an enchantment against magic, basically. It, and and it makes me wonder what happens when that's gone like if he were to go back to living in the dungeon the way he was before he'd have to build that all back up now um so i don't know he just he introduces a lot of interesting questions too um he's important because he brings the cooking knowledge but he to me is the character that is your crafter when you're building a party of characters and you're like okay we've got all the fighters now everybody's got to learn something and so he's like i'll, I'll learn the cooking uh, not, not only is he, is he super funny, um, he has he just has some great moments. His whole everything, it's better to do things the hard way than the easy way. The hard way you earn it, and, and um, you know he's that he's that wild man you meet in the woods who's lived there yeah. for so long, and he's just like, no, I know the woods. Don't worry about it. Um, nope. But he's not always right about everything that he you know. He, at first, he seems like oh, he's very wise, but like you said, he's a lot out of his element. And sometimes has to reevaluate his his own viewpoint on the world, despite that he's been like the source of wisdom for other characters. Uh, I really like that, that, you know, like, like he said, he's always got to do things the hard way. But then there's some things where he's like, oh, maybe that just wasn't quite the right way to do it. Maybe I have looked at it this way. His whole man, the scene with the uh, Kelpie is is mm-hmm. fantastic. But they totally went in a direction I didn't see coming at all. Uh, we'll get to it in the in the recap, but man, it was it was good. Uh, do you guys know the YouTuber Pro ZD? No. Um, he does he does skits, uh, video game skits a lot. I, um, and he does I I know him from board game stuff. He does a lot of board game skits and reviews. Uh, but he is the uh voice the English voice of Senshi. He, he's uh he's a voice dubber. Hmm. Which was which was very cool. He's done some anime before, but um. <laughs> I wouldn't have recognized the voice in a million years. He, he, he's obviously doing a voice, uh, but I, I know from his YouTube channel that he did Senshi, so he did very did, good job. Did he do, like, an old man voice? No, he did Senshi's voice. Oh, you didn't hear Senshi's okay. voice. I Yeah, I know. I've actually watched a lot of this guy's content. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I didn't realize that's super yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, how would you describe Senshi's voice, Jason, his English voice? Uh, it's a bit deep. It's yeah, just um, kind of a gruff guy, like uh, you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Like uh, I, I just met this gruff dude on a construction site, kind of voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's in the sub. I would describe it as gruff, and um, I, I would think of it as old too, but very deep. 
so yeah, we uh we get Senshi uh cooking. Also, uh Marcel starts freaking out, uh especially over the 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 dead plants and stuff. Um and but because she's yelling, a slime attacks her because they look <laughs> to get inside your mouth. Um since she kills the slime and then uses it as an ingredient. <laughs> I I love how he's like, okay, yeah, I, I have this homemade slime drying rack. <laughs> you dry the slime and then they basically make noodles out of it. Yeah. All right. So it's, awesome. it's time to talk about probably my biggest nitpick and Jeremy's favorite thing about the show, or one of his favorite things. Um, the, the cooking, guys. What do you think about how much deal, detail goes into the cooking? Let's just talk about that. Um, so I thought it got old pretty quick. Um, and what I mean by that is I thought it was like, you know, I really enjoyed Food Wars, right? I enjoyed the process of, you know, preparing and throwing it into a pot and doing it. But like, not only did it happen every episode, but, well, okay, most episodes. Yeah, not 11. <laughs> ne- nearly... Nearly every meal was like delicious and like, mm. oh wow, it was so great. It's like not one of them was mediocre, not one of them was like, ah, it's passable. Like, I did remember they did say once, it's like, you know, it's really good, it's just it's a little slimy. Like, mm. and that was like the most critique from it. It's like, I get it, where I, you got Sinchi this- who's got amazing skills, but it's like, not every meal you grab monsters for is just going to be because it was the same shtick over and over oh i that monster looks so gross i don't want to eat it and then they finally get the nerve to try it and they're like oh actually this is super good and then it's like okay wasn't the steamed helmet mollusk not yeah it was yeah it was rusty and moldy tasting right and there was there was only few i remember there was another one that they tried and it wasn't good but it's rare. I, I totally agree with that uh, criticism. Um, I was actually wondering it by about episode three or four. I was like, okay, come on. Are you really going to say everything is amazing every time? Because I want to see you being shocked at the food not tasting good, at it being something that's so far out of your palate that you're like, okay, I, I have to adjust to this meal. This is not what I thought it was going to be like. Um, but at the same time, your point about Senshi's a good cook, well, what happens when Senshi's cooking things that he's never cooked before? Right. We only see that happen like once or twice, and I hope that that's going to happen a lot more in the second half, um, because I think it will yield those circumstances, and yeah, I want that. But as far as the technical presentation of the cooking, I love it. I love it. Um, it's fast enough. They don't dwell on it too long. They're just like, hey, bullet point list, do this thing. And they they show it very quick. Boom, 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 boom. You're done. Meals prepared. It's over. So they don't, I don't think that they uh, belabor it too much. And when they are describing the things that they're doing, because it's exotic ingredients often prepared in unusual ways, like sandwich it this way and do that and peel it like this and cut the head off. To me, it's it's not the same as, oh, they're just cooking food. It's they're dealing with uh, exotic, potentially dangerous ingredients or ingredients with concealed uh, flavors and qualities. And so it takes me back to the days where like I was preparing a role playing game for my wife and. I wanted to have a really robust alchemical system. And so I started researching like mandrake root and um, basically everything that was in this anime. And I was going through and I was researching like, okay, what were the qualities in fiction? What were the qualities in like actual usage of these things? What are the mystical things? How did they talk about preparing it? And I started to come up with my own little concoctions of like, here you go, you've got a decoction of this and a tincture of this and a potion of this. And everything had to have detailed step by step because that's just the way that I like to do things. It's for it to really be immersive. It's got to be every simulated step. And so this anime took me back to those moments. And I was like, you guys, you know what I'm you know what I you know, the way I think (laughs) you do the same thing. I love this. (laughs) You know what I like? 
<laughs> yeah. Every, everything you know need to know about Jeremy in that backstory right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know what? We only played like two games and and it was great. We loved it, but we were like, okay, we're bored now. Let's go find something else to like dig into. <laughs> the system is made, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep, um, moving on. <laughs> I'll say for me, I found them a little bit frustrating. You're right. They're not too long. It's not like it's half the episode or anything, but there is, it, it keeps happening and it's multiple minutes long and it's long. Like you said, it's, it's bullet point. It's, <laughs> said boom, it's boom, long boom. like three times. <laughs> it's long to me, especially because it, none of it matters because like when food yeah. wars was going through, here's the bullet points of how I'm preparing this food. Like, when they talk about how meat's reacting to honey and, and how it's um, you know dissolving it and making it more tender, and I'm like, oh, that, I didn't know that about honey, and I that's real information I'm storing in my brain as they talk about this. And he's like, okay, here's how you prep a slime, and I'm like, I why just prep it? <laughs> like just say slime was prepped. Uh, <laughs> You're, you're too many bullet points. Now my eyes are glazing over. Just give me oh. three bullet points and let's oh. go on. <laughs> um, yeah. So for me, I found them a little on the frustrating side. Beautifully animated. But, you know, I can't eat any of it. So what does it matter? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess that's our thoughts on cooking. So they re- they all introduce each other. They tell him why they're going into the dungeon and they got to get to the Red Dragon. And he asks if he can come along because he's always wanted to eat Red Dragon. Mm-hmm. And so he joins the party. To prepare this ramen, you put in some noodles, a bit of pork belly, some garlic, and a gun! <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> You never seen that clip? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'll send it to you afterwards. I'm good. Fine. <laughs> you know what? Don't enjoy life. <laughs> or run. They, they go to the second level, and when they get there, it's time to rest, and they consider their dinner options. Um. Oh, and then, okay, so. The second level is basically a giant forest uh, at the very top of the the whole castle system. Um, so you're walking through sky bridges, across trees, and there's all these giant man-eating plants. And Marcel gets caught up in one, and they have to, to save her, but they they eat the plants for the night. Hold on, I just Jason just sent me a message. I need to uh, delete that. All right, thank you. Wow. <laughs> That's the way it's gonna be. And then they, they uh, and then I they have prepare some fire grenades to ch- test out next time we play. <laughs> and then we get another not very long, but very detailed preparation scene to make a uh, fruit tart, plant fruit into a tart-like dish. Now, did he say do not eat the crust? Yeah, he said the crust was only there to hold it in shape. Right. Because I saw one of them eating the crust, and I was like, oh, I thought he said don't eat it. Probably Leos. <laughs> he would. The next morning, Marcel wakes up from a nightmare about her mom serving her dungeon monsters for her birthday. But she smells... But not even prepped, just like corpses <laughs> of monsters on a plate. <laughs> uh, but she smells food cooking, and it's from a nearby party who's also camping out there on the second floor. So they decide to go get some, themselves some breakfast, and they go to hunt a basilisk that they know is nearby. Uh, and they go and steal its eggs. But Since then that it's so upset that they're cooking bread and like ham. Yeah. His his little rage fits at like, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah. So I, I the basilisk eggs being uh, like. Malleable snake eggs because they're snake eggs. Uh, yeah, I thought that was cool. Um, Basilis shows up chasing that other party, has our uh, poisons one of them, sees Marcel holding the egg and freaks out. But uh, Leos and Senshi are able to kill it by striking it in both of its heads the chicken head and the snake head at the same time. 
and they're able to kill it. And Senshi prepares its food because it can be turned into an antidote. But he's not going to make an antidote. He's going to make a meal with the antidote in it. That way, it, you absorb it better. Right. You, it, meals are all about nutrition absorption. Yeah, that's the whole point. Mm-hmm. So uh, I love that uh, Marcel get eats before she heals the guy. <laughs> she kind of forgets she's there to heal him. Uh, yeah, they heal the guy, and the guy's like, "How do I get stronger?" And she's like, "Eat good food every day <laughs> and exercise." And exercise. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, this has been kind of bugging me a little bit since this episode. Is I thought that was a cockatrice, and they call it a basilisk. But when I look up cockatrice, it looks like a cockatrice. So I don't know if that's just a language thing or something. Hmm. That's important. That, no, that, 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 that's <laughs> a very fair point. As soon as you said it, I was like, oh, yeah, that is a cockatrice, isn't it? Yeah. And then I checked my notes to see if I had said it wrong, and I didn't. And no, no. Nope, they said basilisk. They said basilisk. They did. Mm-hmm. Because basilisk can turn you to stone, right? Both can. Mm-hmm. Oh, both can. Okay. can as well. Mm-hmm. Not Krillin, though. They couldn't turn Krillin to stone. He's too powerful. Yeah. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> You're the one who brought him up, man. It was a hot take. <laughs> You're just taking this way too personally. It's under my skin. It's so specific. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing against the character Krillin. I'm just saying, and he was great in Dragon Ball Z. I'm just saying, you don't always need a low powered character to do antic things in your anime. Destructo Disc. That's all I have to say. Yeah. That was my know. favorite DBZ. Destructo Disc. Yeah, exactly. Krillin, Krillin was the worst. Okay, I, I just. <laughs> Disc is my favorite too. I love that. Oh, I can't blast you, but I can still slice your head off. It never yep. hits, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I just said that mainly to get under her skin again. So. <laughs> Jason, quit talking about Krillin. We're trying to talk wow. about Wow, it's going to be like this all night, huh? <laughs> uh, they got to get Mandrake. So they, they're, they're wanting to go to the next floor, but... Um, and she's like, yeah, there's not a ton of food down there, so I'd like to stock up on mandrakes before we do. And Marcel's like, I got this. You guys, <laughs> I studied mandrakes, which is funny. because we, we need to man- talk. We had mandrakes in the last anime, too. Um, yeah, yeah, that was actually one of the few scenes I really liked in the last anime. <laughs> uh, yeah, so she's like, guys. They told us you you get a dog and you tie it to the mandrake and then you go to because if you hear the mandrake you'll go insane and die so you got to get out of hearing range and then you call the dog and it'll pull up the mandrake root and Chilchuk's like what happens to the dog what well, will it die <laughs> he's like why would you do that <laughs> and then since she's like I just cut off their heads before they have a chance to scream. And guess what they have in the OP? They have a scene with a dog yes. tied to a man tree. Yeah. Yep. I loved it. So everyone's like, oh, we'll just do it Senshi's way. Uh, but Marcel, feeling left out because she hasn't got to, she didn't get to help with the, the basilisk. They keep telling her, like, don't use your magic. Don't worry about it. Um, so she's like, I'm going to be useful. She's like, well, I don't have a dog. But I know there's these man bats nearby. <laughs> so she tie, she puts up a hoop for a man bat to, not man bat, uh, giant, giant bat. Yeah. Bad bats? I wrote something. They're giant bats. That's really all they are. Big bats. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. apparently what I wrote. Anyway, <laughs> these giant bats. Um, puts a hoop and then ties one to a mandrake. Uh, Cast a spell to wake up the bats. They fly out. One hits the hoop and it pulls the mandrake, but it then flies directly at her because <laughs> she fired the bolt, pulling the mandrake to her. Um, and everyone's like, "What is she doing?" And they get to her and she's completely stunned. Her eyes are pointed in opposite directions, yes. and she's—I I didn't write down what she said. She said some really stupid stuff like, "I no good at." talk yeah. much. Great. Stuff like that. <laughs> this is so great. 
She was the most honest she's ever been, I think, right. because she's like, I'm sad. I feel left out. You know, use my magic. <laughs> like that kind of thing. Yeah, it's they so have to console her like your magic will be super important later at the stronger levels. We need you to conserve yeah. your mana for now and let us just do our jobs <laughs> while we can. However, Senshi then cooks the food and notes that her mandrake tastes better than his because it was fresh, which no. It screamed the bitterness out. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, but that goes into his whole thing of like the hard way is actually the better way. So, you know, he's thinking like, <laughs> oh, maybe that's how I'll do it from now on. I got yeah. to get a fleet of dogs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think I think the reason her magic book said that is probably because if without screaming out the bitterness is probably not as potent for their mm -hmm. alchemical process. Yeah, but. I do think it's funny that you don't really if if all you need to do is pull the mandrake root out from far enough away that you don't hear it, you could just set up a lever system. <laughs> you could just I'm, set up a pulley. I'm wondering if it has to do with the mandrake has to take the life of something around it in order for it to get pa the thing powered that up. Pulls it. Mm. Yeah, so like That's it fine. probably killed the bat. Mm hmm Which I think it did, because they cook up mm -hmm. the bat. Right, so that that's kind of messed up. They're like, oh, we'll just sacrifice dogs. It's like, come on. What do the kobolds think of that? <laughs> <laughs> but they don't talk about it. Um, yep. All right, and then the, for the last part of this episode, we see Chill Chuck working at a uh, trap. They go in a room full of traps. She's like, be careful, do what I do. And then she's just like, oh, whatever, boom, 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 steps on a trap, almost dies. Um and Chill Chuck yells at him, and then he's like, wait, how are the fire traps working? That means there's oil in there. Uh, and he makes Chill Chuck help him break into the oil container in the trap, which is olive oil, um, <laughs> and then use the fire as a cooking flame and deep frying uh, food for them. Which they end up using that olive oil for, like, the rest of the trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, the episode ends with uh, Chilchuk agreeing to teach Senshi some stuff and Senshi agreeing to teach him stuff. Because he was like, you have your job. I have mine. Don't tell me what to do. You do what I say when it's my job. Like, you do the cooking. I'll do the trap stuff. And you don't mess with the trap stuff. And then finally being like, all right, I'll teach you some trap stuff, whatever. <laughs> well, I love it that Senshi's like, okay, sure, I'll abide by that rule. And then he turns traps into part of cooking so that he still gets to boss yeah, Chilchuk I'm, around. I'm... I'm this is cooking. You have to do what I say. <laughs> yeah, go get that trap going. <laughs> and you know what? Deep frying is hard sometimes. Yeah. Especially a turkey. Boom. Yeah, I, 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 did you, do you make those that way, Jason? Do you do, do deep fried turkeys? I have never deep fried a turkey. Yeah, me neither. I'm a, I'm a roast yeah. guy. I just watched it. <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. seen the disaster videos. <laughs> All right. They go through their, a, night, a secret door, thanks to Chilchuck, and Leos's uh, cross guard decoration falls off his sword. He tells the backstory of how he got the sword, which was there was these living armors that attacked him, his group, back when he was just becoming an adventurer. And, and I love this little world building there was like gold on the walls of the dungeon. So the first people going in the dungeon were just like scraping off the wall. They're, they were just gold strippers uh, and stripping everything they could find. And we, that comes up a lot of like, you can now go like three levels down and not find any treasure. They, no one's trying to like beat the dungeon. It's just, Ooh, I'm going to go in here and get money for me and economy. <laughs> yep. This scene was a little jarring just because of how jovial everything's been up until this point. And then all of a sudden we turn around and one of the living armor has just impaled one of his uh, party members. Right. And it was just, it was kind of like, oh, there is some seriousness to this anime. Well, yeah. and the story ends with, and he's like, I, my, I lost my sword and this living armor came up and it stabbed me and I died. And that's how I got my sword. I kept the sword that was impaled in me. <laughs> <laughs> that's where his sword came from. And that was his yep. first death, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> uh, how do you guys feel about 
and I know it's very specific to this dungeon. It's not like an entire world breaking thing, but how do you feel about the, the death being removed as far as like stakes? Now we do still have stakes because hey, a sister is digesting. And if we're going to bring her back, we're on a time limit. So there definitely are still stakes, but do you feel like it removes from the world itself? It was, it was a little jarring at first. Cause I did go, ah, that means like, you know, death doesn't really have a lot of meaning. But building systems and economy around dying adventurers okay. made it a lot better for me. And then also the idea that the further the body goes, the further the soul gets from the body. And apparently it can break away if the body's too far gone. So that did give a legitimate time you know, a, a clock going with right. the, I mean, he even, he even asks in the first episode, Hey, can you res someone from like a pile of poo? Right. <laughs> you hear that's possible. I've never heard that. No. Yes. Yep. So, um, the, and, the, and they're always talking about her, his sister digesting. So it like, they know she's been eaten. They know she's got a limited time. And I think that builds enough stakes for the, for the, level of levity that this anime brings so mm -hmm. yeah i'm in the same exact boat the the rules and the limitation are the primary reason why i'm happy with it but the economy going around it is like a cherry on top <laughs> fair enough i i guess the the reason i asked is because i felt it took some away some of the the emotion the drama of, of death like like we talked about how Leos's reaction is like, oh, my sister died. Oh, and I'll get to eat monsters. Um, <laughs> and and I, I don't know, just that it doesn't. I don't think it does anything to the stakes because, like you said, she's being digested, and they don't even have they don't have time to die. If they mm -hmm. die, they're not going to get right. there in time. So they're they still have to fight for their lives no matter what. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. It just felt like there's nothing really to be sad about. <laughs> Uh, it and also it did tee up a really great joke with that other party that they just keep yeah, yes, across. Yes, that, we'll, we'll that get to that. Good. I do, I do love that joke too. So you're right there. Yeah. All right. Um. Yes. The look at all this barley. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason we're showing this flashback and all the setup is, hey, there's a room of armors, and he's like, oh gosh, it's going to be living armors. So they go in. And the living armors started attacking them, but not only that, they were defending the door on the other end of the hall aggressively. And living armors are usually just attack you if you get close, but these armors are working together and protecting the hall. So they come, they go back, they escape, they go back, um, and they talk about, hey, did you notice that, that they're protecting the end of the hall? I bet whatever's controlling them is on the other side. So Leo sneaks around in the shadows while the others go in and like make a big ruckus and start fighting the armors. So, yeah, and the reason it's not Chilchuck going, doing the sneaking, because he is the sneakiest character. One, he's not going to be able to fight whatever's on the other side, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but also, he mentions that because it's just armor being controlled by magic, they don't have eyes or ears. They don't, they're, they're going to see him anyways, even if he's sneaking. Which is actually not accurate. Yeah, it ends because... up being not true. Yeah, the, they have to look at them, right. otherwise they don't know, but that's his impression at the time. Well, yeah, and the reason I mention it is not because it's important to, well, it is important to what we find out later, but also yeah. that this is a societal norm that dungeon divers just, this is tribal knowledge everyone has, right? Like, yeah. oh, yeah. moving armor, it's being controlled by magic. Yep, it may be inaccurate, but everybody believes it. That's what everyone thinks it is, yeah. Uh, Leos gets to to the other room at the end of the hall, and there's a bigger set of fancier armor, like a lion head helmet and stuff, and giant shield. Um, he starts fighting it and getting his butt whooped, and his sword even breaks. But he notices on the it's protecting the shield instead of using it to defend, uh, and it's because there's an egg sack on the shield. And he's like, wait, so this is a living thing? There's a monster side. He, Which um, means I can eat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, t uh, he also notes uh, that be the helmet is important to its sight. He, the helmet gets taken off and then it strikes at him, but misses wildly. And he's like, it should be able to see. I'm, I'm not hiding very well. It should have spotted me. Um, 
So he goes in the helmet and this little mollusk comes out. He finds out the armors have two layers and these mollusks live inside it and they act like ligaments and muscles to the armor. So he starts taking it up, uh, ends up grabbing the shield and throwing it into the other room. So all the armors in there rush to protect it so the rest of the party can come through. Shows everyone his discovery. Hey, we can eat it. <laughs> it's it's like mollusk. <laughs> so since she creates a bunch of clam food um, yep. or, like like how you have clams on open fire or an oyster on open fire I think it's clams maybe it's clams or uh, yeah and yeah and so he has that but in like armor parts <laughs> instead of actual shells uh yeah they, they eat a bunch of them and then Leos takes the that armor sword and there's a mollusk living inside he's like that's cool. I'm going to keep this a secret. This is my new this sword. This is my new pet. Yep. Pet sword. Kensuke. Yep, Kensuke. They go to the next floor, which is the top of the castle. Um, and Senshi takes him to his home base where he operates out of and then wants to go farm his golems. So <laughs> he explains that they're there's these dirt golems, and they have they're great at always maintaining their moisture. So he, well, he basically knocks them out by taking out their magic totems, uh, plants a bunch of seeds in them, puts the magic totem back where he knows he'll be able to get it, and then lets them defend his vegetable garden for a while, and then comes back and collects it later. Uh, so he does this whole process. They have to help him farm all these vegetables, and he has a ton. Um, he also reveals he takes care of all the bathrooms on this level of the dungeon because they're like, it's so nice that the bathrooms are always fresh <laughs> and that there's flowers in them. Well, since she's been collecting manure. Yep. And, and Marcel starts to complain, and Leos is like, you know, that's what we use for manure on the surface as well. Like, it's not even that different. She's like, yeah, I know. It's just wanted to complain. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to this tavern, which is a basically made up of bandits to sell these vegetables, and the bandits are like, no, that's dumb. Get out of here. We're going to kill you. Um, yeah, that was kind of weird. I would have thought that they'd be happy to have some kind of cooking materials. Even even Senshi was like, come on, <laughs> have yeah. your cook look at this. It's a good, good vegetable. Yeah. Uh, but then a group of orcs arrive and start murdering everyone of the bandits, <laughs> except for Senshi's group. And so they know Senshi. Because uh, he usually trades vegetables with them, but they're like, "Hey, we we got ran out of our home, and so we're not here to trade. We're actually like we're taking up living here, and so we're gonna need all your stuff. Things are tough." And he's like, "Okay, on the one condition that you let me stay the night with you guys." And the works are like, "That's okay, whatever." Um, they're also gonna throw out this uh, spoiled milk, and since she's like, "No." That's yeast. <laughs> we need that. Uh, and so they get captured by the orcs, and Senshi makes bread. And then we get a big argument between the chief orc and Marcel about <laughs> are orcs a bad race or not? <laughs> you run us out of our homes because you keep killing us. <laughs> uh, but he's like, I like her. She she talks straight. Uh, and she's uh, spicy. Yeah, they end up they end up befriending the orcs, who then reveal where the red dragon, which is why they have had to relocate up two floors. They were on the fifth floor. Um, they they reveal how they got up here, where their village was, because that's where the red dragon is. So they're like, hey, if they go kill it, then we can go back. Uh, but they are at the first like no one can know where the orcs live uh, because to the people on the surface, the orcs are a problem that they want dealt with. They they even put up, I think at one point, put up bounties on their heads to, to kill them. All right. So then we, oh, then we get to Kabru's party. Kabru, your party's so cool. It's all big and you guys stick together forever. Everyone's so jealous of your big party. He's like, let's go adventuring, guys. So, and he's the one with the dog in the group. Mm -hmm. Kabru takes his party down and they find a treasure chest full of gems and gold. They're rich. They're like, let's go up and buy awesome gear and, and tons of supplies so we can go super deep in the in the dungeon. And then we come yeah. back to our main characters and they find this group dead. 
Uh, the reason they're dead, uh, th- those aren't treasure. That's uh, bugs. Those are insect bugs. Uh, Apparently super poisonous. Treasure bugs, yeah. Uh, yep. They do attack uh, Leos' party, but Marcel uses a stun spell on everyone. Giant AoE. <laughs> Actually, out. before that, this is hilarious, because as they're approaching, um, Leos' sword oh, yeah. starts jiggling, oh. and he's mm-hmm. like, so like, what's what's wrong, Lassie? Is Timmy in a well? Like, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, well, oh guys, I think there's danger. And he's like, like how'd you know that? He's like, oh, just a feeling, I guess. <laughs> yep. Uh, with the bugs all stunned and dead, uh, since she starts collecting them to cook them, and I absolutely love that he's like, I gotta sort out the ones you can cook from the ones you can't cook, and he sorts all, and he puts all the ones you can't cook in the in in a bag, and he throws it down the, the dungeon. And well, no, he, he gives, gives it, it to children. Yeah, and he's like, oh, you can throw this out. We're not right, gonna eat okay. this. Yeah, yeah. and he's like, yeah, that. Those, like, why couldn't we eat that? Because it was gold and jewels. You can't eat that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, turns uh, the treasure bugs into like sweet treats and uh, they make jelly and have like jelly biscuits they look like a burger but whatever like jelly burgers yeah, yeah. which he uh, then drops because they're chased by a ghost yeah then ghost sh- starts showing up around the dead bodies uh marcel did cast protections on them i think she tied her hair to their mm-hmm. she used some hair yeah yeah and but they run from the ghost. Leos gets he, he trips or he gets sorry, no, he stops. He drops his going. hamburger and yeah, he's like, that's I don't want to leave it behind. Leave my hamburger. Um, so he gets a hit by a ghost and and we find that ghost frees you to death when they touch you, they like suck all the heat from you. So yeah, um, they get to the stairs, they save him, they get to the stairs and like we're not gonna be able to get away from these guys. So since she's like, All right, I'll make some holy water. And he's like, holy water has salt. I just have sugar. So that's good enough. And like just starts ad-libbing all these. Well, the properties are similar. So this is basically holy water. Uh, and uses the the insects to, to to help as part of it too. Puts it all in a jar, ties it to a rope and starts swinging it around and smashing it into the ghost. Laos takes a turn and hits it. And then when they kill all the ghosts, uh, it's turned into sorbet. It was a nice sweet <laughs> treat. They have ice cream. Nope. Yeah, this was cool. I, I agree. This this was good. Just finding out it was ice cream at the end was like, okay. All right. <laughs> right. Well, I like, saw that coming. I did not. There is, I, I didn't. But but as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, yeah, that all checks out, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he put a bunch oh, of ingredients in the jar. He's shaking it around while it's continually getting cold. It's going to yep. turn into a cold treat. Yep. Because yep. he used sugar instead of salt. Like, it, it's yep. all there. It's all there. <laughs> um, but in this scene, Leos um, says, man, I'm so glad my sister got eaten <laughs> so I can <laughs> eat this dungeon food. Everyone's like, no, too too far, man. You, you <laughs> did not just say that. <laughs> <laughs> but this ice cream's so good. Even since she's bugs. like, no, man. <laughs> Yep. Some things you keep to yourself, dude. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. The next episode um, they is when they reach the, the dining hall. And th- this picture starts sucking. They're super hungry. And this and Laos is looking at this picture of food. And it starts sucking in their living pictures that'll that'll eat you. Um, and they save them. And he's like, no, guys, let me go in. I can eat the, the, the food in the picture. So they're like, okay, they tie a rope to him, and he starts going into paintings uh, of people. But like the first one is a king. The king's son is just born, and he's ta- and he's right. he's one of the servants. Like you gotta help bring the food in. So he's like, oh, the vibe's wrong. I don't want to eat here. Uh, but he notices uh, a short elf that's in the in the room. But he gets Definitely pulled back. Like dark elf. Yeah. Assuming that's what dark elves look like, you know. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, he goes into the a, a second picture. This one is at 
uh, the that 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 baby is now grown up and is getting married. It's his wedding. Um, but the king is then poisoned at this wedding and he sees the elf run by. He grabs the food and when they pull him out, though, it doesn't come with him. So he's like, fine, I'll just eat it in the painting. So he goes to the next painting, and this is the coronation of that prince now becoming the king. He eats a bunch of the food, and then the same elf is like, wait, I've seen you multiple times now. Grabs him, starts attacking him, and they pull him out in time. But it turns out food doesn't stay in his stomach, so he's still hungry. None of it was waste. What it all was was backstory for the castle, though. This was all setting up the the lore of the, the man mage who is that elf. This is what I mean by clever storytelling and good writing. Like, that was so much of a lore dump of, hey, here's the information about the king who said this. And the potential dark wizard, maybe, if that's who the elf is. Um, And we didn't have to read it. We didn't have to hear about it in some boring exposition dump or anything like that. It was just like, here you go. Boom, boom, boom. Yep, yep. yep. Any, Any thoughts from you, Jason, on the lore dump? No, I thought this was very clever storytelling um, in pursuit of filling his belly like normal. Yeah, uh, we we get we get some really cool information about the previous owners of the castle. Um, I was for sure in that third painting he was going to get accused of poisoning the king, but uh, he didn't. He was just he's suspicious. But I, I totally saw as soon as the food didn't come with him, I'm like, there's no way it's going to stay in his stomach. So yeah, that was funny. Uh, in the second half of this episode, they find a kitchen in uh, one of the rooms, and they stay there, prepare food. And that night, uh, oh, chill check, before that, they go to bed, spots a mimic chest. And then Freerun falls in it. <laughs> right. Uh, no, he, he starts He starts going through, like, mini PTSD at this point, yeah. because he's like, I've had such bad lucks with mimics, and not... Like it's so like we get a little bit of backstory. He does end up falling for the mimic trap, but then he's like he he's wise to it. But hijinks ensue with every time, even though he knows it's a mimic. And so he's just like, I always have bad luck with him. I don't want to deal with this one, so I'm not even gonna mention it to the group. I'm not even gonna let them know it's in there because then they're gonna want to go and see it, and I'm gonna gonna want to eat it. it. They're gonna want to eat it, and and then I'm gonna have to unlock it, and I don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. My my favorite of the flashbacks is like, yeah, he gets eaten by the first mimic, and then he does the second one, and it eats him anyway. And then the third one, he's like, ah, it's not a mimic. Oh, I forgot about the trap. And it blows up in his face. And <laughs> it had nothing to do with mimics because he was thinking about it. It killed him yep. anyway. That was good. Um, anyway, that night, he sees he goes to get water by himself, sees an insect bug, and is like, oh, you know, I like eating those. <laughs> and starts following it. And it uh, goes into the room with the mimic, and he goes after it. But because um, he's holding water... He's heavier than he usually is, and he triggers the trap, closes the room. So he goes and he sits on this cabinet trying to solve the puzzle. There's elf writing on the wall, and there's all these switches. He's trying to figure out the puzzle, and the cabinet is the mimic, not the chest that he thought the mimic was in. And he ends up having this big life-and-death encounter with the mimic, uh, uses one of the traps to flip it over, gets solves the puzzle of the room, gets out, and drops the door on the mimic, killing it. Um, the rest of the party wakes up and comes, and they see... Oh my god, we're gonna get to eat this! This is amazing! <laughs> because instead of just being a box full of teeth, it's like a like a crustacean comes yeah, out. Yeah, it's like a the hermit box. crab. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It also is like I thought the the mimic was gonna eat the the treasure bug. And they're like, no, that's not how tre- treasure bugs eat mimics. They go inside them and they lay their eggs and all the babies eat the, the mimic from the inside out. And then you have a treasure chest full of treasure that will then that's kill the party so members. Cool. That is very cool. That is so cool. It is such great, like, <sighs> ecology building of both handling the mimic and the treasure bug and also tying it into, hey, where did all these treasure cre- treasure chests full of loot come from? <laughs> Ah, yep, yep. great. Great story. Yeah, it's though. very clever. Mm-hmm. Because the meat is like lobster meat, and they're like, it's hard to get it out. They're like, let's use Chilchuck's lockpicking tools and use that. And he's like, no! <laughs> Not on the stinking mimic! 
Uh, also, Chilchuk reveals his age is 29 years old. Even though he looks like a... Yeah, the whole thing is they're like, youngster, you need to be careful, and, and you know, you're not old enough to drink this, and and uh, but he is a full-grown adult. He's actually which is, older than Laos. <laughs> which right? is funny, because as soon as he says 29, I'm like, oh, okay, so he's getting mid, mid-age almost, and of course, Marcel's like, oh, you are super young, of course, to an elf. Yep. Uh, okay, then we come to Corpse Retrievers coming off Cabra's party. This is the big party that I had mentioned before. Um, Corpse Retrievers come along them, and they're not actually dead. And so they revive them. And the party wakes up and realizes they don't have any of their treasure. They don't know why yeah, they, they died. Paralyzed. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, they don't know why they got paralyzed, but they've been robbed. And they're like, well, these, these hairs are tied to us, and we got the scent thanks to our dog man. Yeah. Cobalt. But <laughs> yep. what's funny is that the one corpse retriever is like, you guys died from the other guy's like, shh. Anyway, <laughs> we don't do this work for free, so they have to pay the corpse retrievers for reviving them. And they leave, and the guy's like, why didn't you tell them? So more bodies for us to retrieve and get paid for. <laughs> like, yep. Why did we stop them from dying? <laughs> The main party reaches the fourth floor. Uh, this is this one kind of breaks my brain a little bit. It's a flooded lake, mm-hmm. but it's above the fifth floor, and you can literally see the dungeon or the castle town below. So this is just water floating in the sky, which we are told like the magic of this place is messing with physics and and like there's doors that lead to nothing in the town and stuff everything's getting warped so it's not like impossible but i have that right it's just a big chunk of water between these two sections there's a map that they show us and it actually shows the uh the water area as like a, a big lake basically that pools down around the castle but then i think you can go down inside the castle through some stairs right yeah and you get below the lake that way but the water is floating in the air. No, I think it's actually on, like, I think the earth comes up against the castle all the way okay. around it. And it might be fortified with magic so that the water can't pierce through it over time. Um, I don't think that the water is, like, visible if you were to look up from that's, below. But I thought but when you looked down, implied. you could see the town. Yeah, because that's what it said. Not through the water. Yeah, I saw yeah. the town through the water. Yeah, th- really? yeah, they show it. Yeah. yeah, there's a scene where they're like, and look, you can see the buildings down below. Huh, I don't I don't remember that. Interesting. The only way to ask is that, you know, um, because there are, you know, so many people are wearing heavy armor, the impression is if you go into the water, you're going to sink. And my thought was like, if you sink, then you fall. <laughs> right. Yeah, you would if that's how it works. All right, I'll keep going while you look that up. Uh, Yeah. So Marcel has a a water walking spell. (laughs) And since she freaks out, no, that's too easy. I hate that. I don't want to do that. They have to Uh, hold him down so she can cast it on him. Um, And then it doesn't work very well anyway, because, again, his his beard and hair is so dirty. I love this scene so much. Leos pushes him off the raft. And he hits the water, and he's on top for a second. And he stands up in his, like, goofy, like, short pose. And he, gets, brrr, he starts to sink. Yep. So he's like, don't worry, guys. I'm going to do this my way. Every time I come here for fishing, there's this Kelpie. And he draws the Kelpie out with um, some bait. And he's like, this Kelpie comes and visits me. I call it Anne. It's my friend. It's a horse. And- Right, yeah. which is yeah. what the kelpie is. Yeah, that's what the kelpie is. Have you? Oh, I've you never have, heard of a kelpie before. I've never seen. You've one. never played God of War Ragnarok and had to ride one. You're very correct. Yeah. It's not a hippogriff, but it's a kelpie. You should play the game. You should ride the kelpie. It's great. Anyway, yeah, he uh, he climbs on the kelpie, and Leos is like, "It's a monster. It is not your friend. It is going to kill you." 
And he's like, no, me and Anne go way back. And then it rides out a little ways and then immediately dives into the water and starts attacking him. And, and Leos has to dive in uh, with a rope and and they kill it and drag him back. And uh, now they have dinner. Yep. Um, again, I, I was talking about how, like, since she's not always right, this was really interesting to me because I thought for sure this was going to be like, hey, I've befriended. I know the dungeon guys. I know this is my friend, and you can trust some monsters. And and the anime is like, no, you cannot. Monsters are monsters. <laughs> they're they're not your friend, and you can't cast them into TV shows. Mm-hmm. That's a reference well, to the movie Nope. I don't know if anyone's gonna get that, but it is. <laughs> yeah, I don't recognize that. So I found the image from the wiki of the dungeon in a side view, and the color of the area under the water matches dirt. So I don't, I don't know. It is a um, hand-drawn grayscale map, though. From it's also I'm presuming it's manga. Um, Which, and. Yeah. The water inside the castle would, it seems to assume that if you're inside the castle, in the water, you would be, if, if you go to the bottom, you'll fall through. At least that, that seems to be the but assumption. I don't, I don't think there's water inside. Like, if you look at the image from the side, it's got, like, the two towers that come up, and then the third tower that goes up to the forest level. I'm pretty sure that that's where the stairs are, and that's how you get below. And so if you don't go through that, you shouldn't be able to get below the water like you'd have to go through the inside of those central columns like the staircase that they went through later if you know better than us comment below yeah yeah clear it, clear this up for us <laughs> it it brings up uh, a thought i had the i feel like there was something missing from the whole economy setup of the dungeon and that is map builders like mm-hmm. that seems like that would be a huge uh, career <laughs> in this whole system is someone who like if you, you would go down you would just map the the path you took and then bring it back to a master map maker who then pays you for your new path and then adds it to a master map that he can then sell for high price to new adventures like, like, mm-hmm. like the office of cartography or something like that right the exactly. fact that they're kind of like wandering off path and, and i was like man if, if every inch of this has been scoured for treasure why are they not drawing it and then it just it just seems to make sense that that would be a essential part of the economy of this mm-hmm. all right um yeah so they he decides he's gonna cook the kelpie and Marcel asks for some of the fat, um, and she they both cook and work really hard on their thing. Meanwhile, Leos and Chilchuck find bodies floating in the water. It's a cobra's group again. <laughs> so good. So good. They got attacked by fishmen, and all their barley has fallen into the water, so they pull them out and lay them out for the corpse <laughs> retrievers to find. Um, like, These guys look familiar. <laughs> there's There's a fantastic scene where Chilchuck gets mesmerized by the Song of Mermaids. And Leo slaps him out of it, and then while they're walking back, Leo starts singing the song, and they're just so annoyed that he yes. knows. He's like, I've never gotten to the end of the song. I learned all the lyrics. And they're just like, oh, he's terrible. <laughs> so good. I've never seen sirens dealt with that way. Right, where you just drown them out with terrible singing. <laughs> And they're just yes. so irritated, they just jump in the water. They're like, we're yeah. out here. Screw this guy. <laughs> I didn't want to eat him anyway. <laughs> uh, this is where Chilchuck and, and Laos have the conversation of, should we eat the dead fish men? No, we said no demi-humans. But what is a demi-human? <laughs> or, <laughs> this is just, uh, He's closer to a fish than a mammal. Right. Laos does take the seaweed that grows on them, because it's not part of them. But he also knows that their eggs are there, and he cooks them <laughs> the food, and everyone loves the eggs. And Chilchuck has to keep silent about it because they definitely broke a rule there. <laughs> um, but yeah, they use uh, Marcel's fat was used to turn into soap. She makes soap for Senshi, and he's like, "Yep, you did this the hard way, so I'm okay with it." So they wash him up, they cast the spell on him, and they all start walking on the water. Then we see and them. Marcel says what happens in the water stays in the water. She does? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then she starts a fight club. 
And then oh, geez. Krillin shows up and throws a destructive disc. <laughs> Even fat makes the best soap. It's true. Would you stop it with the Krillin stuff, man? It is killing us. Krillin anyway. I love that I got so far under your skin. I'm just going <laughs> to live off this for a while. They're, they're fighting flying swordfish. Flying blade fish. Blade, blade fish. Yeah. Um, and Marcel hits them with a huge explosion, and since she gets really upset, like you can't mess with the ecology down here, man. You can't. You gotta just kill what you need. Kill, and she's like, "It's attacking us." <laughs> He's like, "Doesn't matter. You know, you can't. You can't change the ecosystem." And then some fishmen co- are coming, but then they're running from a kraken, and the kraken attacks our party, and they have to fight this kraken. Um, they're not able to damage it. Because it's thick skin, but since she asked Marcel to cast water walking on it, <laughs> and then he so jumps good. on top of it. That was a great use of the spell. Yeah. It it did okay. I pulled a Jeremy here. <laughs> <laughs> if water walking makes the water solid to you, then when the giant wave hits you, isn't that just like a wall of yeah. freaking debris smashing yeah. into you? <laughs> it's basically yeah. concrete. Yes. Right. Unless water walking is a specific spell that only works for water below you. Right. Or or I was thinking like, um, well, no, because the surface is def- the t- surface tension is definitely broken. So it can't be based on that. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, they would have sunk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is a little Jeremy that lives in my head. <laughs> and screams at you, things like you this. You spend enough time with him, it happens. Since <laughs> 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 so a president. Can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> Just crawl inside your ear. <laughs> um, yeah, so they, they're able to kill it, and they they carve out one of the suckers, and Leos eats it, and it's terrible. This is the first time Marcel is, like, excited about a monster they've killed because right. it looks so much like the seafood she likes. She loves octopus and squid, calamari, stuff like that. So... But this one tastes terrible. It's it's weird when they kill it, all the color leaves it too. It becomes like pure pale white. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, it tastes terrible. Then a parasite jumps out of it. So they kill that and and eat that. And so since she grills it up and the and and the, Marcel even admits like this is actually even better than octopus, even though they're eating a parasite. But Leos is like, I even had some uncooked. I took a bite. And he's like, They're like, wait, what? He's like, Yeah, I did. And then suddenly <laughs> He gets really sick, and apparently his parasite had a parasite, and you need to properly cook mm-hmm. your food. But then she learns that the ecology will balance itself out. Yep. You don't have to be that worried. He basically just starts singing, circle of life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it does show a chart, like this big circle. That was the thought that popped in my head. The Lion yep. King never hurts. All right. Um, my soul. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that night, Marcel has to keep waking up and healing Leos <laughs> so he doesn't die from his parasite. Um, and eventually, he Leos gets to sleep. Um, and we get her explaining how dungeons are made. And we see her, her backstory. Like It's kind of hard to think because all the students are like, oh, my God, that's the famous Marcel. She's come to our class. So it's almost like Marcel, who's been a mage for a while and is older, keeps signing up for magic classes to keep expanding her knowledge. <laughs> like I, I'm the most popular student in first grade. Right? Forever. <laughs> kind of like a Billy Madison thing going on here. Um, but what I love about this flashback is, for me, helped me understand what dungeons are. Because at this point, I was like, it's it's kind of weird how this just this is one thing that happened in the whole economy. Well, it turns out there's more dungeons in the world. They're just usually just caves. Um, and all these people basically make all these students basically make their own little jar dungeons by filling in layers of dirt and wood and mana. And and I'm like, oh, it's a terrarium. <laughs> dungeons yeah, are just it's sea monkeys. Yeah, it's just big old, you know. Yep. Habitats. Yeah. Yep. It, for some reason, the whole jar thing just made it all click in my brain. Like, okay, it, it, it all just works for me now. Um, yeah, they're self-contained systems. Yes. And 
they 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 put him into storage and she meets this girl and it's um Fallon it's it's there's a sister back in in school when she was learning to be a mage and everyone marks that she's the weird kid she's always dirty careful when you when you bump into her she'll get you dirty um and marcel notes her her jars sucks like it's got all these impurities in it it's not going to do very well and then they shows them a week later they're all testing their terrariums their little dungeons with candles and the more flame that comes out the more the spirit the better the spirits inside are doing um and Marcel's got a really nice strong flame, and then Fallen does hers, and it like flame to the roof, set the building on fire, kind of stuff. Nearly he, explodes. Yeah, huge. Yeah. And they're like, "Oh wow, that's a crazy terrarium." So she goes to Fallen and asks, "What? How did she do this?" And she's like, "Oh, because I took dirt from an actual dungeon, and then takes um, Marcel. Again, this, this is when they were young. I, Marcel, I don't know how old she actually is because she's elf." When Fallen's young. Yeah, Fallen's young. Takes her to this dungeon, which, again, is just a cave with, like, a little shallow water around a mound of of grass and, like, it's a slime that comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and Marcel's like, I'm going to kill it. And and she's like, no, you don't. You know, it's doing its work. It's doing what it needs to do. We're in the sunlight. We're safe. Um, And just again felt very miyazaki like hey don't mess with nature just let nature do its thing and and work with it instead of burning down forest kind of thing very miyazaki or a giant ghost deer will come and murder everyone yeah oh wait wrong wrong movie um well also like oh my god i remember that she used to talk about you and he's like yeah she used to talk about you i shouldn't mention what she said because she made fun of them. <laughs> uh, they get ready for the next leg, leg of their journey. Uh, okay, this I love this scene. So uh, Marcel is, I forget what she was doing. Is she bathing? And so she had the water, she hot was water? wiping herself down. Yeah. yeah. Right. Essentially with, with her clothes on, though. Right. Yeah. Right. Sponge bath kind of thing. Um, and and yeah. her, her water gets too hot and starts boiling. So she goes and she pours it into the lake. But it disturbs an undying, which is water elemental. Oh, a water elemental. Yeah. It, it, yeah, they said that this, it's a ball of spirits. That yeah, that's how they explain it. This is a ball of, of spirits, and um, it starts attacking her. She, when she's running from it, she jumps onto the lake to dodge an attack, and realizes her water walking spell is wearing off, so she's having trouble staying on top of the surface, and she doesn't have her staff. So it, it hits her uh, in the shoulder, I think, the first time, or is it the leg the first time? Okay, yeah, leg first like time. The first time. Um, and she's trying to attack it. She's running low on mana, um, but she eventually spots it because now it's a has the her blood inside it, so she sees her blood flying around and use, does a giant explosion on the water. Um, Laos has to catch her. They can't come onto the water to help her because, again, the water walking spells is wearing off. They catch her. They take her inside. Okay, hold up. The animation for this particular scene is one of my favorites because the way that when he's catching her, it switches into an almost like Looney Tunes cartoon-esque way of presenting the the struggle for holding on to her. And it's just, it's so good. Yeah, he's leaning way out, legs on, you know, feet on the ledge while um, Senji and Chilchuck are like holding onto his back, trying to pull him back. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. And honestly, the whole scene, it trigger, trigger started triggering like there hasn't yeah. been a ton of action in, up to this point, and I, I was really like, "Oh, there you are, Studio Trigger." I've been waiting. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But what we did learn from this scene is that the reason mages need a staff is to focus. It, it doesn't keep them from casting, but they can't focus because when her explosion magic is very scattered, it's almost mm-hmm. shotgunny when she does it. And I think it, she also winds up not using the mana effectively. And I, what I mean by that is quantity, too. So, like, she right. goes through so much mana so fast here. Um, so I think the staff is is probably another way to, like, more effectively use less mana, too. Not just for accuracy, but maybe just in principle. Um, they, they stop the bleeding, but she is badly hurt, and they have no healer. And she's out of mana. The solution they come up with is to cook 
the kelpie liver <laughs> they end up cooking a bunch of the kelpie anyway uh, and, and eating a bunch of the meat uh but the liver you know specifically to help restore her her blood and stuff um what's funny is that it shows them all eating the parts that are ready because the liver takes longer to cook and then they feed her the liver and she's like i want the other parts too because <laughs> yeah. they all look so good so um that at least gets her out of the woods injury wise but um She's still mannerless. And then we, the episode ends with another party smelling the food. And then this party is Namari, who is their dwarf warrior from their old party. Um, and she is leading Mr. and Mrs. Tansu, who are gnome explorers, into this dungeon. I want to get your guys' thoughts on Namari, and then we'll talk about Tansu after that. So your guys' thoughts on Namari. She was good. Um, I liked her practicality. But also that she's even though she's like, I'm there for a job, I do this to get paid, she still had a soft spot for her old party. She she wanted to see them succeed. She wanted to make sure they were okay. But you know, she's she's got bills to pay too. Yeah. I really like the decision they made not to have her rejoin the party at this time. I'm sure yeah. she's going to because she's in the the OP. And I think everybody in the OP will eventually become really important to the party. Um, but yeah, if she had joined the party right away, uh, it would have felt a little bit cheap <laughs> to me. It would have lessened the uh, the quality. So this this was a really good decision. Um, she needs time to kind of have a, a logical progression into how she gets back into that group. And, and while, like you mentioned, Jason, she does like definitely have a soft spot for this group and doesn't feel great about her decision. I also love that the anime doesn't treat her as like villain, bad guy, made selfish yeah. decision. It was like, no, this this was a fair choice for her to make. Giving it's more of a business decision right. than it was like uh, preservation. Yeah, and it's funny too, if you look at the OP, uh, or no, the ED. Yeah, the ED. It's got a shot of her in the bar. And there's a bunch of uh, dwarves sitting in the, uh, the the corner table, and they're pointing at her and talking, and she's got a sweat bead on her forehead. So um, she does not have a good reputation already, or that's something that the anime is is going to eventually have happen to her. Um, it's interesting storytelling beat. Um, also, you know, we, we mostly have only met one of each race for the most part. Um, so getting to meet another dwarf and realizing that Senshi is unique, not for being a dwarf, but just because Senshi is unique. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I enjoy that, too. So, um, so having this other dwarf who, who's a little bit more classical dwarf. I care about weapon and smithing, and and that, those yeah. are my specialties. And even Senshi just upsets her because he doesn't care enough about that stuff. <laughs> and he has to hide some things from her. <laughs> just to make sure she doesn't kill him. <laughs> when, when she finds out what is... She what a span is. That's pretty great. Yeah. Uh, any any thoughts on Mr. Tansu? I again, he's he's a shrewd businessman. He is there for a job, um, and he's there for compensation. And if you want his help, especially since he's got a job to do, you're gonna need to pay him. Um, which makes sense to a, a degree, but I mean it's a little self-centered because it was like he's he's right there you just cast a quick spell come on what i liked yeah. about his party being there however because it could have this had the potential of just feeling very shoehorned as far as plot device going oh marcel's hurt how are we gonna heal her oh healer shows up yeah uh, um again i the best word I can come up with for a lot of the stuff in this anime is clever. Um, it's stuff that was worked in very well and woven in very well. He's there to study more about why this castle is underground and has become a dungeon. And it's not, again, it's not expedition dumped. It's not, uh, it doesn't feel forced. He, they just happened to be there because they were doing some more study and investigation and happened to cross their party. At the same time, the audience gets more world building. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I like the conversation that he has with the uh, lord of the area yeah. later. 
that yeah it kind of really gives us a hint at um this this dungeon is the center of some greater turmoil and as we've talked about before like what makes this dungeon unique is the immortality of it which they call a curse but to me seems more like it's probably going to have its origin in a tragedy um based on mm. I, I think it's that elf that's doing it um probably to like preserve the the prince or something yeah uh, we'll that makes sense that makes um the really the reason i brought him up to talk about him was that second scene with the lord um the way they use that they, they set it up great here because he mentions that you know i'm here for the circles and he talks about the the curse of the dungeon um but then he has that conversation with the lord and it, it gives you so much history so quick about like the elves and the dwarves were fighting and the elves allowed the humans to come here but you almost never see it. it's almost always humans you know, are allowing Invading. the elves. Yeah, and, and and we'll let the elves keep that forest over there. The dwarves will keep that mountain. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost always human supremacy. And it's the first time I think I've ever seen where they're like, we'll allow the humans to have like an area. We'll give them this crap place. And the elves are even like, hey, actually, that's our dungeon. We want it back right now. <laughs> yeah, um, give it back. <laughs> which is none of it is really important to what's happening to our main characters right now. It's not what they're, they're caring about. They're not even... You know, they're not thinking about conquering the dungeon. It, that question comes up at one point, and he's well, is like, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. Um, but it, again, it gives you that like, this world is bigger than this one story. The there's political things going on everywhere. Everyone's having their own major story. We're just jumping into this one slice of it, uh, which I love. And we get a small taste of it back with the orcs because he asks Slaos like. What are you gonna do? And do you slay the mad uh, mage and take his place and own the own the dungeon? Mm -hmm. The one thing I cannot believe is real is the name of Mister Tansu's companions, Kiki and Kaka. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can't remember which is which either. <laughs> Kiki's the girl, so, Kaka's the, girl. the guy. <laughs> yes. But I don't think I've it's ever heard the name Kaka that. ever. <laughs> Not as a name. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, so, the, yeah, this group shows up. They're like, no, we're not helping. We're, you know, uh, Marcel is upset at Namari. Mr. Trons is like, look, you guys just need to do the dungeon thing and go home. Like, it's not my problem. Um, and they're like, oh, there's a, uh, oh gosh, sorry, help me out. Water, undying. There's an undying out there. And he's like, well, we're gnomes. Okay, we get along well with spirits. It'll be fine. Uh, they go out and the undying attacks them because it's so angry. Uh, and he pulls Amari in front of him and she gets headshotted. I, my jaw dropped. Like, I know we've right? established you're not going to die, but I'm like, did I? In most anime, you they'd show that and it'd be fine. Like, oh, I scratched my head. No, she's got a freaking hole right in the center of her head. She <laughs> drilled. Yep. She's done. Uh, uh, yeah, he pulls her in and revives her. And so he changes and his mind. Pissed. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody points out, that's literally what you're here for. I have revival magic. You're a bodyguard. Which one of us should die? <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, yeah he uh comes up with a deal with laos and senshi that hey you guys help me um look for these circles and i will heal your companion so they go into these stairs where there's just overgrown roots everywhere and he's like hey guys clear the roots so i can read this elvish and when they do the roots attack them it grabs kaka i believe <laughs> and the girl so kiki oh it'll so be kiki, kiki then and, and, and she Leo's has a like, crossbow, and crossbow yeah, got taken up yep, there. Yep. And Leo's like, oh, it's tentacles. And they're like, well, you need to stop it. He's like, there's not a whole lot you can do against tentacles. They kind of they paralyze you the instant that they grab you. But he comes up with a plan, borrows Senshi's helmet, and jumps up into the tentacles. And he frees the crossbow, which Namari is able to fire and kill the monster, saving them. And then he has big old swollen puffy stung face for the rest of the, the episode um and mr tansu heals everyone including um marcel, marcel. 
this is also where we learn that Senshi's pan is adamantine, uh, and they they eat the the tentacles, which looks like a banana, probably very much on purpose. But yeah, it reminds me of a of a plantain banana because it separates so much more easily, right. um, or a durian, the way a durian separates up. <laughs> I love I love uh, Senshi's holding it, and he's like, guys, uh, what do I do with this? Like, why are you holding that? He's like, well, I grabbed it and then it paralyzed my hand and now I can't let go of it. Yeah. Um, so they pour vinegar on it and then they eat it. And then I was like, no, I hate vinegar. I would never eat that. In one million years. Yeah. And you guys should know about me. I hate vinegar. What about soy sauce? Yeah, I like soy sauce. I, and I, even, I even like sushi. And yes, I know. You know. Tabasco. Must have. Yeah. And I know Lots. vinegar. But I like... So hot sauces, when it comes to hot sauce, the less vinegar flavor there is, the more I like the hot sauce. Ah. So Tabasco is actually pretty, pretty low on my list. What are we doing now? What? Sweet hot and sour soup. Quit mentioning Krillin. We have to move on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, also we learned Senshi hates resurrection magic. Just, it's the yeah, worst. It's too easy. Too easy and unnatural. He's gonna claw back from the other side. <laughs> Do it on my own. Resurrect myself. Yeah. Um. So they come because the the pan is adamantine. They decide to trap the undying. Oh, so okay. Yeah. Marcel, but like Marcel, you go back with them. Tansu's like, I'm, we're going back. You know, we 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 because of the undying being so mad, we can't go further. Um. We're going back. We're going to wait a week and then we'll come back. And they're like, okay, Marcel, you go with them because your mana's all gone and you need to, to heal up. And she's like, no, I want to stay. Let's capture the Undyne and I'll drink it and get its mana. So they, the plan is catch it in the pan with the lid, cook it until it's dead, and then drink it. Um, they made which, a mana potion. I love that. <laughs> that is so cool. So the plan, the the pans are able to block the attacks, but Leos is not strong enough to hold the pan. He needs superpower dwarf strength. So Namari jumps out and helps, and her and Senshi are able to trap it and get it onto the fire and hold it till it burns their hands, but it cooks the undying. Uh, Marcel does drink it, but then they're like, nah, if you want to get the nutrients, we need to cook it. And they make <laughs> uh, a soup. Yep. A stew, yeah. And then everyone eats the stew together. They convince the the prissy Mr. Tansu to even eat dungeon food. Then her mana comes back. Yep. Yep. She gets her mana back, and they go on. Um, they come to another uh, tower of stairs, and this one is full of tentacles and vine monsters and and plants. Uh, and then frogs, giant frogs, attack them and start stealing their weapons. So great. <laughs> and while they're the only one left is Senshi's axe, so they're tr they're fighting with a monster over that. So Chilchuck realizes the frogs aren't hurt by the tentacles, so he carves out frog skin, wraps it around his hands, and uses that to pull a monster out of a trap. He gets grabbed by the frog, but the trap goes off and kills the frog. And they're like, "This is a genius plan. Let's skin the frog, take the meat for eating, and use the skin to make suits." <laughs> And how do you convince Marcel to wear it? Tell her she'll look really cute. Tell her she's going to yep. be cute. Yep. And you know what? They were right. They <laughs> Everyone were. was adorable. It was so cute. Yeah. <laughs> they get to walk through a, a jungle of monster vines, and Leos loves it. But then they get to the bottom, and Marcel's like, why is it sticking to me? Do we have to fight dragons in freaking frog suits? <laughs> Um, then we get the scene of Tansu's group going back, and this is where he has that conversation we already mentioned with the island lord about um, the elves want the dungeon. And he's like, hey, man, we got to get that uh, that immortality spell, <laughs> so don't give it to him yet. We'll stall them, and we'll find that spell. Uh, I, and then there's, there, we had mentioned, again, the uh, corpse retrievers are, are like... Uh, the tow truck. Namari actually goes there and is like, "Have you have you collected a human who looks like this?" He's like, "That's Fallon." 
Because you asked the age. She's like, 20 to 40? He's like, oh, you mean Fallon. You know she's like 20. What are you doing? Because <laughs> dwarves, dwarves don't know how humans age. Nope. Uh, but no, they do not have Fallon. Uh, they get to the next floor, which is the the castle town. Which and is floor five, right? Floor five. And they find the home of the orcs, um, get some supplies from there, and then they find a bunch of burnt and killed wargs, which mean the dragon is nearby. Senshi makes bread so they won't have to fight it on an empty stomach this time. And they come up with a clever plan to kill the dragon using falling buildings, narrow alleyways, and distraction. I love the, how big is the dragon? I'd say about as high as that thing up there. You mean where the dragon literally looked like he bonked his head? <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess I guess that would be that. Um, there's also a great scene of Laos, like, thank you guys for all you've done. I, I couldn't have done this without you and they're all like stop this is so cringe <laughs> say yeah. that kind of anime <laughs> yep i actually loved that he actually said you're being cringe yeah oh he didn't say that in the sub oh yeah chill check said yeah. uh they uh they get into place marcel rigs a, a building to explode with elven runes which you know, I didn't even put together that the runes is what made the, the dungeon we created in the first place, but it all makes sense that they use the runes for magic spells because that's what we see here. It's basically setting a fuse up for her. Mm -hmm. um, the others distract the dragon and get it to chase them, and they use the pans to block its flame, but Laos didn't remember that it would then get hot because it's a pan. <laughs> And distributes heat evenly. So they lose the lid, uh, but they keep running. They actually run straight to Marcella. She's like, wait, that's early. Uh, are, are we going early? Okay, we're going early. And she drops the building, and it lands on the dragon, who then just stands back up and shrugs it off like, I'm a freaking dragon. What are you doing? That's, I'm yeah. fine. Um, so they... The, so Laos and Chilchuck wake up underneath its head after it like, you know, stomps, and He's like, oh, man, I just need to get my sword and I can stab it. But the sword, uh, still with the mollusk inside it, who likes to react to danger, jumps away because <laughs> it's not going to mess with the dragon. So they And Chilchuck sees this. One thing I love about Chilchuck is how observant he is. He seems to know what's going on with everybody, other, all the other members of the party, and he realizes instantly what has happened. Like, oh, that son of a... He kept him. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> I'm going to kill him. Uh yeah, those two and Senshi, they have to hide under the dragon's belly, who's, like, looking down between its legs. They're like, this is where we live now, at a dragon's crotch. <laughs> That's what Chilchuck said in the, the dub. It's great. <laughs> but he's back, the dragon's backing up towards the town. They're like, we're running out of room. So Senshi jumps out to sacrifice himself. The dragon steps on him. Chilchuck runs out. I forgot to mention... Uh, um, Senshi's knife. Senshi has a cookie knife made of mithril that can cut through anything. They stab the dragon in the toe, but it can't feel it because it's just a little cooking knife and it didn't pierce anything. It goes through the armor, but it doesn't do anything. Anyway, uh, Chilchuk picks that up and throws it at the dragon's eye and it works. So they get Laos' sword. He runs up and meets up with Marcel and they come up. he comes up with a plan. I'm going to stand on the pan. You're going to blast the plan and I'll land on the dragon's face and then I'll be able to kill it which actually works, but he needs to get under its chin. So he puts its leg, his leg in its mouth. And then while dangling from its mouth, stabs it in the chin, losing his leg in the process. This was so good. It wasn't a matter of, oh, I'm just going to willpower my way through it for my friends, for my sister. It was a tactical decision with sacrifice to get into the right position. So good. Yeah, it, it takes his leg, but he's able to get that killing blow. Mm hmm. And I was trying to think, like, okay, why is that spot going to kill it in one blow like that? The only thing I could think of is it's like a major artery that's, or vein that's going, carrying blood. So it just causes that depressurization and collapse. It's the only thing I think of. All right. 
That's important. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not saying it's not. I get my thought head went to. I actually agree with you, Jeremy. As much as I do love emotion and willpower winning the day, I don't mind when good tactics and smart decision making and and true sacrifice also win the day. Yeah. I just really appreciated this because this devolved, like their plan devolved into pure panic so fast. Mm -hmm. Like, and it was fairly realistic in that perspective that like, all right, we got this great plan to take down this enormous beast. Oh, it just thought that tickled. Oh no. Now what? They had no plan B. Like, Yep. I thought that was great. That there's no plan B, no plan C. It was just pure panic, and two people or three people got severely injured because of it. Mm-hmm. Yep. But you need to let the Krillin thing go. <laughs> this, this is this is getting out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> he said something about destructo disc this time, right? I heard destructo disc. <laughs> That's how the leg got attacked. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, so... Krillin finally hit something. The dragon falls to its death. (laughs) Laos falls without a leg. Um, Marcel comes up, and she heals everyone. Uh, This is an amazing scene. She heals Chilchuck first, and he starts screaming in pain. And then she's like, wait, what just happened? She's like, no, it's healing magic. You get a a pain backlash because you heal so fast. And, And so she's like, no. No, no, no. <laughs> and she's like, I'm fine. I'll do it the normal way. <laughs> she looks That'll take so months. <laughs> evil with like, I'm going to heal you right now. It's going to be so quick. <laughs> um, and then she goes over. She he- uh, reattaches Laos's leg, which I love the it itches. And he shows him constantly scratching at it for the rest of the, the time until other stuff happens. But uh, cool attention to detail that. Both his armor doesn't grow back or anything, and we constantly see that scar and wound for the rest of the time he has it. And then they get to work on retrieving Alan. Love this scene because yeah. Krillin gets stepped on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I just I, I really appreciated that it wasn't like okay we killed the dragon and then like there's like some sort of montage and then it's like oh we got sister back and like you know oh we're we're heading to say you know we won the day it wasn't that it was like okay now the real work begins now that you have access to it and so yeah it was having to dig through multiple car size organs right and, and yeah, the scale of it the fact that they had to like make a tunnel into the body just to get mm-hmm. to organs because of how thick the the skin is thick the muscle is that they're literally like we're gonna need a like a, a light in here and he's like oh no we can't do that <laughs> nope. so eventually they find the stomach and they pull it out and they open it and it's empty and I go, oh, maybe, maybe we're too late. And so then they check the intestines, and they're empty. And then Laos remembers that dragons also put stuff. They're like owls. You can think of it as a pellet, right? Yeah, but they use it for fuel for their fire. So it's mm-hmm. in the fuel bag. So they cut open the fuel bag, and there are a bunch of bones. But there also are the warg bones in there. And the anime goes through the grueling task of bone by bone reconstructing someone now they're like okay let's just take all the bones up to the the, the corpse retrievers they'll know what to do and they're like or marcel's like no we can't with this much time from the death the soul is and almost, damage to the body yeah the the soul is almost completely unbound we don't have time to move it you guys need to know my true specialty in magic is ancient magic and i know how to resurrect people and they're like, that's black magic. It's evil. She's like, yeah, that's the magic doesn't have morals. It's just how you use it. Uh, but then she c- cuts her hand, grabs her <laughs> staff, and then uses the blood to write a, a, a very demonic looking like, yeah, like not evil runes. at all. <laughs> like this is fantastic. She's like, oh, it's not evil. And then she just draws like the most evil looking ritual yep. on the ground. <laughs> Yep. And, and they didn't just have to build the human skeleton, they had to rebuild the wargs to make sure they don't mix up any pieces and, and 
and screw it up. So they That's rebuild. Shocking. Like, and when they talked about the wrist bones, good luck. Good yeah. Luck. No, yeah. They're That's showing insane. the wrist, and I was like, no. <laughs> Tiny yeah. squares is what he could do. Yeah. Yeah, I had a wrist injury a while back, and so I looked up the structure to try and figure out, like, which bone is not in the right spot. It's insane. And if you just had a pile of those bones, good luck, because you're not going to find a way to just, you know, make them click together unless you've studied this really That's well. A, the second Jeremy backstory to the, all you need to know about Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> wrist is good now. Yeah, you keep figuring it out, guys. <laughs> Um, he did the senshi way. That's right. <laughs> so she casts the spell. I, I, the the animation it's very it's a very fast moment, but it, it's beautiful of like rebuilding the body from the inside out, like well, structure for structure. I, I love this. We have the like dichotomy of yeah. her describing like I'm gonna use this magic for good, and like you know it's there's no morals to magic. It's fine, and then she draws this evil looking ritual and then as she's casting her eyes like the pupils go to the back of her head yeah. like there's just this dark essence around her as she's casting the bottom That's... of the staff like opens up like tentacles yes. spreading out the <laughs> blood uh-huh very eldritchy then, yeah, yeah eldritchy is the right uh-huh. word yeah and then like the body starts to rebuild but like really viscerally mm-hmm. um oh and and we we missed that like Part of part of the issue was that they didn't have any cattle for the calories required to rebuild yeah. the muscles and ligaments. So they were like, well, we've got this big dragon here. That's a lot of meat. And Chilchuk's like, you're going to use a dragon to bring a person back to life. Let me just be clear. You're using a dragon <laughs> to rebuild a person. And they're like, well, yeah, we would use cattle and, and sheep. He's like, this is this is bad. This is a this bad idea. Yeah, yeah, Chuk- Chuk- wrong. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. He's he's so against this. He's like, okay, <laughs> one, it's black magic. Two, you're doing real bad stuff. Three, we're using a dragon. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. Balan's alive. <laughs> covered, <laughs> Marcel's passed out. She's covered in uh, Balan's covered in blood, but she's alive, and they they cover her up. And she's a little confused. Marcel wakes up and hugs her. They they go bathe. And she's like, oh, God, I, you guys didn't have to go all this way out for me and stuff. And, and, then she, and Marcel's There's like. One yeah. thing that we're skipping, and it is important, I think. And this yeah. is the dream that Laos has right before they go to resurrect her. And in this dream, his sister says, go on without me. Like, leave me behind. You you it's enough. You don't have to get me anymore. I kind of wonder if that was his real sister saying goodbye because she has such a strong ability to interact with ghosts. So what would she be able to do as a ghost, right? Visit him in his dream and say goodbye. And I kind of wonder if what they resurrected is not necessarily completely just her. Not just the dragon, but also like her being ready to move on. Right. I mean, there's there's definitely something weird with her, right? You're absolutely right. I did skip over the dream. I didn't even think about that. I honestly, because it was right after a flashback, and I was like, is that part of the flashback? Was that separate from the flashback? I, I, I wasn't sure what to do with it. So that's a good call out. Um, I, I'm sure there's a part you're right. I I don't know if I agree that the real Fallon's not at least in there and now just something right. more, or if this is just something completely different that has Fallon's memories. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between those two things is <laughs> probably not even that important. Could be, could be touched on in the, but I mean, there's also. But you're yeah. saying like the Fallon's soul is gone and this is something else that's come to life in Fallon's body. Yeah. Or potentially like, a fragment of her soul is still present, but not because she wanted to be like she was done. She'd moved mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if that's what the dream was trying to say. Mm. That's good. Um, in the bath, she met, you know, Marcel mentions that she's out of mana and, and really drained and Fallon, like here's the mana. 
And she's like, whoa, you can't do that. You know, you just came back to life. You can't use any magic. She's like, oh, I feel powerful. Like, I have a, I feel, and we see, like, all the mana glowing around her. Then they all eat, well, no, like, let me get this right. Sanshi decides to cook some dragon. And he goes <laughs> and tries to make a cooking fire right outside of it. And they all run out because, um, you know, the gas is still out there. And he sets off each explosion. But Fallon saves him without casting a spell. I mean, she cast a spell, but she didn't use an enchantment or a staff or anything. Uh, and they're like, how'd you do that? She's like, I don't know. I just felt like I needed to protect him. And so I did. Mm-hmm. Sign two, there's something else going on. Anyway, they go and eat a mm. uh, dragon tail because the stomach is now completely on fire and will be for a while. So they cut up the tail and they use that fire <laughs> to help cook it as like a giant oven. Um Using dragon scales as like um, stone, like grills. You for pizza, yeah, and grills. Um, <laughs> and they make they make dragon pizza and all this dragon food. And like a oh, Fallon, we're gonna eat the dragon. She's like, yum, and she eats the dragon pizza. And then she's like, wait, what else did you guys eat? That's so cool. And they're like, okay, that's not what we thought she'd say. <laughs> Laos is excited that yeah. she's excited. Yeah. They decide to spend, they decide to spend the night in one of the buildings in this town. Um, we see Fallon talking to a little girl, telling her, "Hey, we're just going to stay the night for the night." So this scene's weird because yeah. she sees this little girl open a door and like start talking to her. Well, actually, I, we never hear the the girl's voice, but when Leos looks. We had seen just a couple of seconds earlier, a chill truck had been opening doors and they're walled off like Matrix style. Like, because the magic has been warping the town, right? We know right. stuff is weird here. So, like, they open a door and it's just a brick wall, but to Fallon, she sees a room, or at least a dark darkness back there, not the brick wall, and, and a, a girl, girl come out. So she sees something that the rest of the party doesn't, which is established earlier in a, in a flashback that she sees she sees dead people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I do think you're right that there's something different about this one because uh, this is not a blue person when she looks at them, and all the ghosts have been presented as blue. Anywho, <laughs> when they, they go to bed, she goes and to talk to Laos and she heals his leg, which he's kept scratching this whole time um, at the scar and she heals it. Um, and then he scolds her for sacrificing herself. She says she doesn't remember doing that. And then we see the mad, or what I assume is the mad mage, the, ma- the elf we saw from the, fly- the paintings. Uh, checking out the resurrection circle. Now, <laughs> they'd had a conversation about that circle, and Marcel had been like, let's just make sure we erase it before we go. She's like, I'm not ashamed of what I do, but let's not mention the resurrection to people because <laughs> that'll get you some bad stuff. Um, and then we, yeah, the, the 12th episode ends with that mage, the elf, finding the circle. So that's where we're stopping for now. All right, it is time for our final reviews. Uh, Jeremy, hit us. Hit us with your final review. I love it. It's great. Um, it's funny. It, the technical presentation of how the dishes are made is fun for me. I, I love it. I can't gush enough about the world and just the cleverness of the story building in this anime. It's really cool. It It really scratches that itch for like a micro made in abyss and even a touch of like cells at work Mm. um, vibes that I get from it. So really, really enjoyed it. This one is a five for me. All right, Jason. Uh, I'm mirroring a lot of what Jeremy said, like the cleverness of the storytelling is fantastic. And the world building is probably some of the best that we've seen in quite some time. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. I agree. Oh, but blows it, it, it's rearing out of the water. <laughs> I would say, but um, blows Krillin out of the water. <laughs> definitely. Yes. What doesn't blow Krillin out of the water? Um, you need to stop. <laughs> they, 
I ha- I have some nitpicks with it. Um, it it was funny, but it wasn't laugh out loud funny. The s- the action was decent, but it wasn't out of this world, and the cooking was not. After a while, just kind of wasn't my taste. Um, I'm gonna give this a four. It, it's a high four, but it's not. It's not quite what I'm looking for in an anime, but the technicality, the animation, and the storytelling is top notch. So um, I'm going to give it a four. My real, real only nitpick with it is that it's a studio trigger anime, and there's no hype. Like, where's the raw pumping adrenaline that I associate with? Studio Trigger, whether it's a fireman turning into a giant mecha or uh, twin star destroyers and lightsabers coming out of 12 places, like whatever. Um, or a living dress turning somebody. Yeah, in, galaxies into, being yeah. thrown at each other. Or, or Destructo Discs, but oh wait. <laughs> I really like it. Um, I, I do think it's missing that hype. I, I I'm going to go five. I'm going to go five for now. I, I'm enjoying watching it. The, char- the characters are so good. Um, I really, I think that I latch onto them the most. And I'm just really excited to see just where they end up, what happens to them. I don't really care that much about the Mad Mage. I know it's going to be a major part, but I just want to see, especially now with um, Fallen in the, on the team or whatever they're having to deal with Fallen, that, that completely changes the trajectory of the anime. It can go in any direction it wants now. There's a ton of possibility. That's super fun. Um, the animation's gorgeous. So I could use some more hype, but I'm still going to five. They didn't write it, though. I know. How can but... they do hype if they don't have anything to hype about because they didn't write it? I don't think they're going to go too crazy with hype. even in I, the don't, second half. I don't think they are. I'm not. Well, guys, I gave it a five. <laughs> Back off! I'm just saying. I wish there was some hype. I'm not saying there has to be, or even, you know, whatever. You could just go saying. watch Darling in the Franks again. I don't think Krillin's in that one. <laughs> is that is that Trigger? Yeah. Uh, I looked up a top ten <laughs> anime yeah. by Trigger, and it was in the list. It, it's the only it, reason they I know. Don't, they don't always hit. <laughs> Uh, I guess Little Witch Academia is also one of theirs. I, I hear it's, I hear it's great. I haven't seen. It. I hear it's great. I probably I, I bet you I would like it if I if I probably. had the time to watch it. All right. Um. Yeah. Five for me. That's good enough. Uh. Our again. Our next uh, episode is going to be featuring the next twelve episodes of this anime. More uh, dungeon meshy. More delicious in dungeon. Mm. So we will see where this goes. Where it ends. Again, Probably more than anything, I'm excited the fact that we just get like a resolution, a ha- an ending. Mm-hmm. You know. So, looking forward to that. If you have thoughts on the first half of Dungeon Meshi that you would like to share to us, things you would like to correct, tell us we're right, tell us we're wrong, whatever you need to do, you can reach us on our Twitter at Baka Podcast, on our website, theanimebakaclub.com. Hit that contact us button. It's going to come back to us. Or. Wherever you found this podcast, there's probably a comment section or a review or something you can hit with five stars and a thumb or a bell, uh, sparkles. I don't really care what it is. Just hit it. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, thank you so much for listening along and coming on our delicious in podcasting. No, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you just got to throw things out there, see how they land. Let's say goodbye. Krillin in Dungeon. Thanks for there listening. you are! <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. I know.